It will roll call in about 30 seconds. Stand by, please. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, September 1st. Oh my God, how is it September? Uh, but it is September 1st City Council public hearing on land use matters. I will um, uh, entertain, well actually, sorry, a couple of things I gotta do here. First of all, I will uh, acknowledge that the very lands we're talking about are Treaty 6 lands and that the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Blackfoot, and the Kota Sioux peoples have called these lands home for centuries uh, or millennia in some cases. And of course, this is also a great homeland of the Métis Nation, and we respect and honor those relationships and that, that history as uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous Edmontonians come together to build a better city in the spirit of treaty and reconciliation and shared prosperity and and lots more. Um, but I do need now a motion to adopt the agenda that's before us. So moved. So moved. Uh, I think Councillor Henderson got that one. Uh, no changes to the agenda, correct? Okay. So we'll... Uh, uh, on 310, there's replacement pages. I, I will move... I don't um, have a golden rod. Oh, I, no, sorry. I'll move, I'll move the agenda yes, with the replacement pages under 310. Attachment 1, Charter Bylaw 193386, page 12 of 13. Attachment 2, Administration Report, page 4. And attachment 2, Administration Report, appendix 3, page 4 of 4. Thank you. Uh, seconder for that? Second. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Any questions on the agenda? Not seeing any, then please vote. Yes. That's a verbal yes from Councillor Nicol. <laughs> Yes, from Councillor Pickett. Noted. Councillor Zadek, we need your vote. Okay, let's actually pause the vote for a second because uh, it's been noted that I didn't do roll call at the beginning. So I should uh, I should do that, and then we'll uh, we'll recall the vote in a minute. So, um, uh, though we've already adopted the agenda, and I think no, that's the vote that's on the on on the table right now. So let's pause for a minute. I'll do roll call. Just make sure everyone's here and who uh, who should be voting. So, um, <clears throat> Councillor Knack. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Councilor McKean. Good afternoon. Welcome, Councilor Nickel. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. Yes. We heard you a moment ago, welcome, Councilor Walters. Good afternoon. Welcome, Councilor Banga. Good to go, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Carmel. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Councilor Katarina. Yes. Welcome, Councillor Zadek. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Councillor Essinger. Uh, present. Hello, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, here. Welcome, and Councillor Henderson yep. is live and on deck here. So that's, uh, that's everybody. Let's try the vote again on the adoption of the agenda with the additions 
in uh, 3.10. Yes. We're waiting for votes from Councillor Cartmel. Sorry, it's not coming up. I'm a yes. Thank you. Thank you. And display the vote. And the agenda is approved unanimously. Thank you. The, uh, there are no protocol items today, I don't think. So we'll move into the explanation of the public hearing process. The clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with in order, and I will call out the names of the people registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council will select the bylaws that uh, council wishes to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion today. Council will then listen to each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate, and for each of those items, administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw, and then members of the public will be invited to speak virtually using the Google Meet. Those in favor will speak first, followed by those opposed. Each will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer. However, attendees may wish to use a timer at home too. When the speaker is finished, please stay on the line as council may wish to ask you questions. After comments from the public, council may ask questions of city administration. And after all the speakers and questions have concluded, the chair will then ask each speaker if they wish to speak to new information which arose during the public hearing. This process does require some patience to ensure that anyone who does wish to address council has an opportunity. Thereafter, Council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. I would ask that you please refrain from using the chat function in Google Meet during the meeting as it can create issues of decorum, provide an unfair advantage, and can interfere with the live stream. Additionally, please remember to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions. If you're experiencing any difficulties at all, the, officers, uh, the Office of the City Clerk has resources available to facilitate communication with those participating in the statutory public hearing process. Please reach out using the contact information provided in your registration or to city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Okay, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Items 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, bylaw 19136, amendment to the Big Lake Area Structure Plan? Item 3.2, bylaw 19129, amendment to the Kinglet Gardens Neighborhood Structure Plan? Or item 3.3, charter bylaw 19130, to allow for low density residential uses, street oriented residential uses, and a stormwater management facility in Kinglet Gardens? Yes, I have Elise Shillington to answer questions only from Stantec. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and Scott Riestad to answer questions only from Anthem United. Yep, I'm here as well. Welcome, and nobody in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.4, Charter Bylaw 19401, to allow for the expansion of a religious assembly building in Lansdowne? Yes, I have Keith McIntyre from the Lansdowne Community Baptist Church. Yes, I'm here to uh, answer questions only. Oh, questions only. Okay, super. Thank you. And Wixie Chow, also to answer questions only. Yeah, I answer the questions only. Thank you. Thank you. And I have nobody in opposition on item 3.4. Items 3.5 and 3.6 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.5, bylaw 19402, amendment to the Central McDougal Queen Mary Park area uh, redevelopment plan? or item 3.6, Charter Bylaw 19403, to allow for a high-density mid-rise building in Queen Mary Park. Yes, I have Marcelo Figuera. Good afternoon, um, I'm here. Uh, uh, we can either just uh, respond to questions or we have a presentation if needed. Thank you. Okay, so questions only unless a, pre a, question, uh, a presentation is requested. Understood, yes. thank you, Marcelo. And uh, I have no one in opposition on the Queen Mary Park item. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.7, uh, bylaw 19320, to close a portion of road Strathcona? Uh, no, I have no one registered either in favor or in opposition on that item. It's city driven though, so administration can answer questions if there are any. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.8, charter bylaw 19399, to allow for small scale infill development in Glenwood? Yes, I have Lucas Sherwin. Yeah, hello here. 
Uh, and are you to present or uh, answer questions if there are any? To answer questions only. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I have no one registered in opposition on item 3.8. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.9, Charter Bylaw 19400, to allow for small scale infill development also in Glenwood? Uh, no, I have no one registered to speak on that item. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.10, Charter Bylaw 19386, to allow for a mix of load intensity commercial uses in Chappelle? Or uh, I have no one registered on this item either. Uh, this kid, this Pardon me, is there somebody who's here for uh, the Chappelle it, item? Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I, I registered for this item as well. It's Marcelo Figueira. Oh, hi, Marcelo. Uh, okay, uh, uh, questions yes. only? Yeah, I do have a presentation if, if it's requested, but questions only. Understood. As well. Okay, yeah. so Mr. Figueira is here for 310 uh, if needed. Um, thank you for letting us uh, know. We'll make sure the records reflect that. Next. Items 3.11, 3.12, and 3.13 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.11, bylaw 19264, amendment to the Windermere area structure plan? Item 3.12, bylaw 19265, amendment to the Windermere neighborhood structure plan? Or item 3.13, charter bylaw 19266, to allow for medium density residential development in Windermere? Yes, I have Sylvia Summers from Stantec Consulting. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Hi, welcome. I have Nazar Samji to answer questions only. Yes, I'm here. Welcome. I have Alim Samji to answer questions only as well. Uh, I'm here as well, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. And Patrick Wong to answer questions only. Uh, I'm here. Welcome. And then in opposition, I have Colin Van Buskirk from the Windermere North Neighborhood here. Association. Here. Welcome. I have David uh, Honstein. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. And Rose Honstein. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. Is there anybody else here for the Windermere items that we've missed? Not hearing any then. Thank you. Items 3.14, 3.15, and 3.16 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.14, amendment to the Fort Road Old Town Master Plan? Item 3.15, bylaw 19251, amendment to the Belvedere Station Area Redevelopment Plan. Or item 3.16, charter bylaw 19262, to allow for low and medium rise multi use housing in Belvedere. Yes. <laughs> yes, I have uh, Margot Auger from, or OJ. Uh, please correct my pronunciation from Treaty 8 First Nation of Alberta. Hi. Welcome. And I have uh, Chris uh, Janvier or Janvier. Let me know which it is. Yes, present. Welcome. And uh, uh, also from Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta and Loretta Belros. In attendance, thank you. Welcome. Uh, also from Treaty 8 First Nation. Um, and in opposition, I have Don Grimble from the Fort Road Business Improvement Area. Uh, here. Welcome. And Han Leong, also from the Fort Road Business Improvement Area. Yes, hi, President. Welcome. And uh, last but not least, the trumpeter item. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.17, Charter Bylaw 19281, to allow for a variety of low density housing forms, a greenway, and boundary adjustments to three pocket parks in Trumpeter? Yes, I have um, Elise Shillington and Scott Reestead, uh, who were previously acknowledged uh, for the first set of items as well. So, uh, and no one in opposition uh, on 317. So, Let's do selections now, if we can open up the speakers list for uh, to register to make selections. Councillor Carmel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll take items 311, 312, and 313, please. Noted. Thank you. The Windermere items have been selected by Councillor Carmel. Councillor Walters. Uh, I just have a question for admin on 3.4. It's 
Great. Okay. For questions of administration on the Lansdowne item, uh, Councillor Walters has selected 3.4 and Councillor Paquette. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'd like to select items 3.4, together. If they are dealt with together. Got it. The, uh, the, the Belvedere items have been selected by Councillor Paquette. Are there any other selections? Mr. Mayor, I'll make closure of all other items. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Katarina, seconder for that? Second. Thank you, Councillor Nichol. Please vote on closure of the public hearing on those items not selected for uh, discussion today. Yes. Uh, Councillor Cartmel, we need your vote. No pop up again. Any, or pardon me, um, Devin, uh, I'm a yes. We're good to go, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. And that's carried unanimously to close public hearing. Mayor. Okay, Councillor Katarina, on first reading. I'll move first reading of. Uh, 3-1 to 3-3, 3-5 to 3-10, and 3-17. Second. Okay, so that will constitute the omnibus here uh, on first reading. Please vote on the omnibus. Yes. Yes. Jim. Thank you. We're good to go. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. I'll move uh, second reading, Mr. Mayor, of the omnibus. Second. Thank you. On the omnibus, second reading of the bylaws, please vote. Yes. Yes. We're good to go. Display the vote, please. Carried. Mayor, I'll move consideration third reading uh, on the omnibus. Second. To allow third reading to proceed, requiring a unanimous consent, please vote. Yes. Yes. We're good to go. Display the vote. Carried. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, third reading of bylaws uh, 19136, 19129, 19130, 19402, 19403, 19320, 19399, 19400, 19386, and 19281. Second. Thank you. On the listed bylaws, please vote on third reading. Yes. Mr. Mayor, did you get a vote pop-up? Sorry, I forgot to hit submit. Okay, we're good to go. Display the vote. Carried. And so for those following uh, along, the uh, Kinglet Gardens uh, changes uh, have been approved. The um, Central McDougal Queen Mary Park uh, changes. The Strathcona Road closure the two Glenwood items, uh, the Chappelle item, and the Trumpeter item have all been approved today. So thank you for joining us for those items, but uh, you're dismissed uh, uh, if, you're, if you're here for those. You're certainly welcome to stay and watch if you like, but uh, we're going to go first to the Lansdowne item now, uh, directly to questions of administration. Uh, Councillor Walters, go ahead. 
Thank you. No presentation required. It's just a matter of uh, the part of the administration uh, report where it, under the technical review section where it says all comments from affected city departments and utility agencies have been addressed. And I wonder if that's in fact the case. Um, this is an issue of our now famous fire hydrant and water main expansion uh, challenges. And I wondered if someone from planning could tell me if those have been in fact addressed or if some solutions being worked out there, uh, the exorbitant cost on the applicant. Again, in this case, I, I wonder about the viability of the project for them or the extra cost of the project. So is there any updates on that? Uh Councillor Walters, to our knowledge, they, they have been. We can confirm that with you offline, if, if that is fine. Um, the, the file planner, I believe, had, um, had had those discussions and everything was fine leading up to this. We didn't hear anything else, so we're presuming they are, but if not, we can let you know. Okay. Maybe it'd be appropriate then, Mr. Mayor, for me just to ask the applicant uh, that question, one of the... Uh, Mr. Chow or if they had any ongoing concerns about that. Uh, this is Keith McIntyre from Frank oh. Hilbig Architect. Um, under, we're aware under, of the, Under uh, new information, the, just, to be, just to be crystal clear then. Sorry, go ahead, okay. sir. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Don. It's okay. Just to add, Councillor, um, we're waiting to hear back from uh, Fire Rescue Services on the level of the need for the uh, the water and the hydrant right now. It's uh, an ongoing review of the study that uh, typically doesn't come into effect until the, the development permit stage. So it's advised okay. at the rezoning stage that this requirement is there and then that can be lifted through further study at the development permit stage. Uh, Councillor Walters, Ms. McCabe here, just wanted to add that we are well aware of um, the importance of uh, being able to give an applicant uh, accurate information. And we've been looking at risk um, and risk mitigation for fire hydrants. And I'll let Ms. Petrin speak uh, more about the process improvements that we've been looking at in this area. Sure, thanks. Sorry, just uh, figuring out my microphone here. Um, so yeah, through the development permit stage, um, we work with our applicants, Edmonton Fire Rescue Services, to ensure that the development um, proposed uh, can deal with the required water flows either and, and fire safety standards, either through mitigation measures within the building or if uh, additional infrastructure is needed. Um, so we are working with uh, fire rescue services as well as EPCOR um, to look at risk and establish different ways to dealing with the servicing requirements. Okay, so I appreciate that and, and, and grateful to know that there's uh, work being done to, to sort that out. Uh, and, and under new information, if the applicant wants to provide any updates, I'd be happy to hear those, Mr. Mayor, before I move closure. Okay, <laughs> let me just check uh, if there are any other questions of administration. Not seeing any. Then under uh, new information, um, Mr. McIntyre, go ahead. Uh, I have no nothing to add right now. We've uh, had an independent uh, review of the... Uh, fire water requirements. Uh, the fire department needs to do their uh, own uh, analysis and uh, we wait on that. But uh, as far as uh, we're concerned, the, the project is moving forwards. This is just the, uh, the change of uh, land use and, and not the uh, development permit application. Right, thank, I, and I understand that I wanted to raise it today. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's all I had, Mr. Mayor. So if there's Thank nothing you. else, I'm happy to... Okay, I'll just see if there's any other new information that's arisen. We're not hearing any. Second that. Then uh, Councillor Walters will move and Councillor Banga will second. It sounds like uh, closure of the public hearing on item 3.4. So please yeah. vote on closure. Yes. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried. And I'll move uh, first reading of item 3.4. Second. 
Thank you. On first reading of item 3.4, please vote. Yes. We're good to go. Display the vote. Carried. Well, we're second reading of item 3.4. Second. Second reading, please yep. vote. We're good to go. Display the vote. Carried. I'll move uh, consideration for third reading on item 3.4. Second. Thank you. Yes. To allow third reading to proceed today, please vote. Display the vote. Carried. Uh, and I'll move third reading of uh, Charter Bylaw 19401, Mr. Mayor. Second. Third and final reading, please vote. Yes. Display the vote. Carried. Okay. Um, I understand we've had an additional person register um, to answer questions only. Uh, Claire St. Aubin. Uh, from the City of Edmonton uh, on uh, item 314, 315, and 316, uh, which is the uh, Belvedere item. So, uh, Claire, are you there? It doesn't look like she's joined yet, but we have confirmed that she has the, the information. So. Oh, okay, well, we're a few minutes away from that item yet because uh, we've We'll turn now to the items before it, uh, the Windermere items specifically. So uh, I think we should get the presentation now and then we'll hear from speakers. Okay, uh, Rob Heinrich here, Senior Planner. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, welcome Rob, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. Items 311 to 313 pertain to the rezoning of land in the northeastern part of the Windermere neighborhood in southwest Edmonton. This application is composed of three parts, an amendment to the text maps and statistics of the Windermere area structure plan, an amendment to the text maps and statistics of the Windermere neighborhood structure plan, and the rezoning of the affected land. Slides one and two show the land in context uh, of the ASP. The subject lands are located in the northeast corner of the plan area. The proposed change in the ASP will be from institutional and residential mixed use for under the current plan to residential use under the proposed change. Slides three and four show the subject lands in the context of the neighborhood structure plan, which contains more details specific to the neighborhood. The subject site is located along the northeastern edge of the neighborhood next to the Anthony Hende Drive and is buffered from nearby residential development by a portion of the North Saskatchewan River Valley Ravine system along its western boundary. The purpose of the application is to facilitate the development of medium density housing. The net effect of the change will be a slight increase in the projected number of dwelling units and population in the Windermere neighborhood. Approximately 196 units based on the plan forecast. The amount of land involved and the scale of the change in land use will not alter the planned residential density of the neighborhood. It will remain at 24 units per net residential hectare. From a drainage perspective, the neighborhood sewer systems have been sized and designed to accommodate the development of this site. And the system has sufficient capacity to handle this proposed development. Slide number five shows the proposed rezoning and the surrounding zoning context. The site is bound on the northern and western boundaries by ravine and natural area, and on the eastern side by Anthony Hende Drive. 
zone A metropolitan recreational and AG agricultural zones respectively. The southerly abutting zone is zoned RA7, low rise apartment zone. Farther to the west and southwest across the ravine is low density residential housing under a variety of low density zones, primarily RSL, small lot residential and RF4, semi-detached residential. This bylaw proposes to rezone the subject site from AG agricultural zone to DC1 direct development control provision. Slide number six shows the proposed rezoning area overlaid with an air photo. From this, we can see that the subject site and the southerly abutting land is currently undeveloped and the westerly neighboring lands are in an advanced stage of development. The built form and development regulations of the DC1 are modeled on the RA7 zone. So it will be consistent and compatible with the southerly adjacent property. The DC provision also contains additional requirements such as a requirement for an environmental impact assessment regarding the upgrading of 16th Avenue roadway access and its design respecting the ecological needs of the ravine system. Requirements for shared emergency access and utility easements with the southerly abutting property. Offsite improvements such as the construction of 16th Avenue complete with a three meter multi-use trail. The provision and construction of a multi-use trail along the top of bank of the subject site. And the DC also contains a reduction in the development density from that projected in the neighborhood plan. The applicants have proposed a maximum density of 81 units per hectare versus the 90 units per hectare that is projected in the ASP and the NSP. With regard to public engagement, notifications were sent to 3,722 landowners. 35 responses were received and an open house was held on September 24th, 2019. The open house was attended by 76 people and administration received 51 feedback forms. Further details about the engagement is included in the What We Heard report document that is attached to the council report. In summary, some concerns were expressed about impacts upon the ravine and natural area. There were some objections to multi-unit housing and there were perceived reductions in property values. The majority of concerns, however, related to traffic and transportation. So in this regard, um, I'll ask Mr. Ford to click the next slide, please. With regard to transportation items, uh, access from this part of the neighborhood is limited to three access points along Windermere Boulevard. A traffic impact assessment was prepared in 2016 and a traffic impact assessment addendum or update was prepared in 2019, which updated the traffic analysis and took into account feedback collected at the September 2019 open house. The main concerns that administration heard from the residents are with regard to student and pedestrian safety adjacent to the schools, the use of outdated traffic data, traffic queues on Windermere Road, and increased traffic volumes on neighborhood roads. Key elements of the updated TIA included data collection and a detailed queuing analysis at the intersection of Windermere Boulevard and Windermere Road, site observations to examine uh, traffic operations and safety adjacent to the schools, and the implications of the full build out of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Key findings of the TIA were as follows. Southbound traffic at the intersection of Windermere Boulevard and Windermere Road currently experience considerable delays. With full build out of the neighborhood, local and collector road intersections will continue to operate at acceptable levels of service. The proposed change in land use is anticipated to generate traffic of about one vehicle per minute. The projected volumes are considerably less than those associated with institutional uses, which were originally envisioned, envisioned in the neighborhood structure plan. Daily volumes on local and collector roads are in line with the traffic projections that were presented in the original TIA that was completed when the NSP was adopted in 2006. Next slide, please. Administration completed a school safety review at Constable Daniel Woodall and St. John Catholic School in 2018. As a result of this review, pedestrian crossings, flashing beacons with pedestrian push buttons and related signs were installed at three locations on Windermere Road. And across a marked crosswalk with signage was provided on White Law Lane. 
Next slide, please. In response to what we heard regarding transportation items, the anticipated shift to citywide 40 kilometer per hour residential speed limits will improve the safety and livability of Edmonton's neighborhoods for everyone. A traffic signal is planned to be installed at the intersection of Windermere Boulevard and Windermere Wind by the end of this year. This is anticipated to di divert some traffic from Windermere Road and improve operations. Traffic operations at Windermere Boulevard and Windermere Road will continue to be monitored and additional mitigation measures may be implemented subject to further review and availability of funding. Similarly, operations will be monitored on local and collector roadways closer to the development and changes to on-street parking regulations and speed limits can be reviewed if operational or safety issues are identified. Transit service in Windermere currently has bus routing available to Century Park LRT station during peak hour periods. The bus network redesign will provide LRT access to Century Park during all time periods. Next slide. In addition to the local improvements and strategies mentioned on the, in the previous slides, broader network congestion issues are being addressed through a citywide review of priorities. Earlier this year, funding was secured for the Terwilliger Drive Expressway upgrade between Anthony Hende Drive and White Mud Drive. The project will include four lanes in each direction, including a dedicated bus lane. Next slide. Finally, Alberta Transportation is widening approximately 18 kilometers of the Southwest Anthony Hende Drive, adding one lane in each direction. This project started in fall of 2019 and is expected to be completed in late 2022. These upstream and downstream improvements are anticipated to play a part in reducing some of the congestion issues currently being experienced in the Windermere area. Administration supports this application as an appropriate use of land at this location and recommends that council approve these bylaws. This concludes our presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Hendricks. Uh, we will now hear from uh, Ms. Summers from Stantec. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just waiting for my presentation to come up. Okay, I'll get started. Good afternoon. It's our pleasure to be here today in front of you requesting approval for this application. I'm here today with my colleagues who will be available for questions. Patrick Wong with Stantec will be available to speak to any traffic impact assessment questions. And Nizer Somji and Aleem Somji, Jaffer Inc. are representing the ownership group and are available for questions as well. Next slide, please. The site is 2.18 hectares in size and is located in the northeast corner of the Windermere NSP plan area, directly adjacent to the Anthony Hinde and south of the 16th Avenue Road right-of-way. Next slide, please. This site was owned by the YMCA at the time the Windermere ASP and NSP were prepared and is identified as institutional with the opportunity for medium density residential. This land was originally purchased in July 2011 from the YMCA with the intent to build an Ismali Jath Makana and Centre, a place of worship and social gathering for the Ismali community in West Edmonton. When the Windermere NSP was prepared, 16th Avenue was to be the main access point for the site to Windermere Road. In the interim, the section of 16th Avenue between Windermere Road and Whispering River Drive was developed as a multi-use corridor with no vehicular access, thereby rerouting traffic from the site through the neighbourhood. Consultation with the community members in 2012-2013 uncovered concerns associated with traffic volumes and times of day for traffic that a place of worship, such as the one being proposed, may generate. After consideration of community concerns and consultation with the City of Edmonton Planning Department and then Councillor Anderson, it was agreed that the proposal for the site be modified to allow for medium density residential. Next slide, please. In addition to and in support of our rezoning application, we are seeking to amend the Windermere NSP and ASP to reconfigure the designation of this parcel of land from institutional to medium density residential. Our application is in alignment with the intent and policy as outlined within the Windermere NSP. Within the NSP, this site is designated for institutional uses. However, within section 4.2 of the Windermere NSP, the following is stated. 
The institutional site is located south of 16th Avenue, immediately west of Anthony Henday Drive Interchange. This site is currently owned by the YMCA Foundation and has therefore been given an institutional designation. In the future, should this site be transferred out of the YMCA's ownership, an MDR use compatible with the MDR site to the south is appropriate. It should be noted that the parcel to the south is currently zoned low-rise apartment zone, RA7. Next slide, please. Our application is seeking a direct development control provision zone on a parcel of land currently zoned as agriculture to allow for medium density residential. We've utilized the low rise apartment zone as a guide for the regulation within our DC one zone. We've taken the approach of a DC one zone to provide more assurance to the community as to what can be built given the specific parameters of the site. We have not included commercial uses that are included within the RA7 zoning within our proposed DC1 zone and have significantly reduced the unit density from 125 units per hectare to 81 units per hectare. The proposed density is similar to the RF6, medium density multifamily zone. To determine the appropriate density, a traffic impact assessment was prepared. In support of our application, we've coordinated and conducted a significant amount of technical reviews and studies over the last several years. These studies were reviewed, reviewed matters related to transportation, environment, top of bank stability, geotechnical, and servicing capacity. The results of these studies have indicated that the site is able to support the development as proposed and is outlined within the NSP policy. As part of our DC1 zone, we've also committed to provide a significant amount of offsite infrastructure, which includes the following the construction of 16th Avenue from West Spring River Drive to the east limit of the site within the existing road right of way, construction of top of bank, a shared use path and associated landscaping and upgrading of the public pedestrian walkway system adjacent to the site and 16th Avenue. Next slide, please. This slide provides a brief overview of the allowable density, height and range of residential uses. So the height is being proposed and in is line with uh, the RA7 zone. And the residential uses, um, as previously mentioned, commercial uses have been stripped out of it. So strictly residential uses within this DC1. Next slide, please. In summation, the proposed development is in alignment with the Windermere NSP, increases housing choice within the Windermere neighborhood, responds to community concerns by allowing for residential land uses only, and limiting the density to 81 dwelling units per hectare. Next slide, please. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much. Uh, questions for Ms. Summers? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have questions. I'm not quite sure how to request an opportunity to speak. Sure. Let's use the, um, the Hangout function for now, uh, but uh, I'll go to you first and make the assumption that you're, as the selector of the item, I'll give you first up each time and if others have follow-up questions please just put them in the hangout for now um, okay go ahead Councillor Carmel thank you Mayor Iveson uh, so thank you uh, Ms. Summers for the presentation today uh, I have a few questions about uh, first of all the site and zoning data okay um, so first of all with respect to building height that would allow uh, a building of about how high in, in terms of stories would that be a, a as high as a four story walk up? Yeah, it's basically, it's the same height that's allowed within the current RA7. So the current RA7, if you're doing a flat top roof, you're looking at 14 meters in height. And if you're looking at more of a peaked roof, you're looking at 16 meters in height. So we very tried to very closely align where possible mm -hmm. this proposed DC1 to the existing RA7 requirements. Uh, now this has got a, a reduced dwelling unit limit, so it's it's more in keeping with the RA6 limit, is my understanding, in terms of numbers of dwellings? That is correct. The RF6 allows for 80 dwelling units per hectare. Um, we are proposing 81 dwelling units per hectare, and um, the basically the RA7, if it was a straight RA7, would allow for 125 dwelling units per hectare. So this is an increase then? No, this is, a, this is a decrease. So basically if we were to propose an RA7, with a, it would be 125 per hectare. Um, per hectare. We are proposing 81 dwelling, per, 81 dwelling units per hectare, correct, so, which is close to the RF6. But the, the, the net result of that is 175 dwellings. 
correct when you times 2.18 hectares that's uh, that's the number you come up with okay thank you so it range of use includes no commercial uses but does include minor home-based businesses can you describe what might be expected there um, minor home-based business is a is a single individual working from home there's no outward uh, uh, traffic or ramifications from that individual working from home. So there's not necessarily high traffic volumes for clients. There's no outward signage to indicate that this is being for any use for any type of commercial opportunity. Now this, this site has uh, somewhat of a relationship with the RA7 site to the south. Uh, is that correct in terms of entrances and exits and sort of shared uh, Shared ingress and egress, yes? Uh, no. So the only um, access and egress, uh, each site, the RF7 to the site, has its own access and egress to the south. For ours, we are proposing using 16th Avenue uh, Road Right-of-Way, which is directly north of the site for our access and egress. From an emergency access perspective, we have written into the DC that um, there would be a emergency access easement. So at the DP stage, exactly what that would be determined, maybe bullards, so on and so forth. So traffic generated from each of these sites would be independent and there wouldn't be an intermingling of the traffic generated from each of these sites. Well, so let's maybe talk in a bit more consumable language. This site would need to have a second emergency egress access, presumably to the south. That is correct. correct. And that's okay. written in the DC-1. And same for the RA-7 site to the south. It would need some sort of emergency e, uh, access or, or uh, second emergency uh, access point to the north. I'm assuming so. When they went in for a development permit, there would potentially be that requirement, and that's what this uh, this would allow for. And that RA7 zoning uh, to the site to the south does include commercial uses, correct? There's no limitation on what can there happen. Is, right. No, it, it's basically it falls. It, it is zoned RA7. So whatever is now permissible under the RA7 or in the future under the RA7 is what can be developed on that site. On that site. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at your proposed zoning slide. I believe that'd be slide five. And it's it's got um, a, uh, an area A, uh, as, I, as I'm reading it anyway, that would essentially is the wooded lot or, or sort of a, a ravine remnant that would be between these two sites and the single family uh, homes to the west, correct? That is correct. That's part of the North Saskatchewan ravine system. And that wooded, wooded lot is not affected by this rezoning. It remains... No, not... A, it re, that is correct. It remains as is. Okay, my time is just about up. I would need a second round, please, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, let me just check and see if there are any other questions. I'm going to get a second round, then. motion for a second round. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Second. Seconded by Councillor Knack, I believe. Uh, is there any objection to a second round? Not seeing any. Then carry on on the second round, Councillor Carmel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, Ms. Summers, I'd like to move a bit now to the traffic concerns that have been expressed. Uh, I will note on, and I want to be very clear about this, that on administration's uh, presentation, a slide came up that um, showed 16th Avenue as a road between Windermere Road and Whispering River Drive, uh, which is not adjacent to your property. Uh, it's a set, it, it shows essentially as a continuation of Windermere Wind into 16th Avenue. Uh, currently, the, that is a, essentially a green belt, if you will, with a multi-use trail. Uh, it, has that roadway been closed? I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor, I can't answer that question for you. I don't know if that roadway has been closed or if it's just been determined and developed as a multi-use corridor. That would be something administration would might be able to answer for you. So the traffic uh, impact assessments that have been done for this development, uh, what do they think that road is? Is it a road or is it a greenbelt? We assume 
and uh, Patrick Wong could speak more definitively to this, but we is, have always assumed um, that that is a uh, basically a multi-use corridor uh -huh. that vehicular access is, is not allowed on. So we have not take it in, taken it into our consideration from a traffic impact assessment as to where traffic may flow. So in the the traffic impact assessment then that was completed, uh, does this site, uh, was it considered as additive to the site to the south or is the site to the south not considered as part of this, of the current TIA? That would be a question Mr. Wong would probably be better able to answer, Councillor. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, this is Patrick with uh, Stantec. Okay. So basically, with the uh, the updated uh, the memo we completed uh, earlier this year, we have also included the site to the um, south. Uh, sorry, hold on just a second. We've um, we've got to unfortunately treat speakers one at a time. It's uh, strictures of the process here. So um, if uh, if Miss Summers, if you want to defer all further questions on that, um, we'll we'll loop back around to Mr. Wong. Um, but we just have to take this in order. So, uh, Councillor Carmel, if you have other questions for Ms. Summers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Perhaps one more then. Uh, we've made reference, Ms. Summers, to the original uh, neighbourhood structure plan, I believe, uh, for Windermere. Uh, and that, that neighbourhood structure plan speaks to densities and number of units, etc. And, and uh, I believe your presentation states that this uh, development would not substantially change what was expected in terms of those numbers. Is that fair to say? Am I capturing that correctly? Yes. Um, basically, oh, the numbers I'm presenting are from a individual site, but the NSP looks at the cumulative aspect when it does its, uh, its calculations. So what we're proposing would not add significantly to the NSP. So you're, you're essentially saying this does not add significantly to the overall numbers of dwellings or, or residents or traffic in this neighborhood. That is correct. Do you know if that NSP was updated uh, with consideration to the removal of that stretch of 16th Avenue, which is now in Greenbelt? I do not, Councillor. Okay, I believe that's all my questions for you, Ms. Summers. Thanks for your presentation today. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Ms. Summers? Not seeing any. Then, Councillor Cartmel, did you have questions for um, Mr. Samji or Mr. Samji? Or uh, did you want to go ahead to uh, follow up with Mr. Wong? Uh, uh, I have questions for Mr. Wong, if I could. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Or, uh, pardon so, me, let me just double check. Does anyone else have questions of uh, either Mr. Samji? Okay, not seeing any, then go ahead, uh, Councillor Carmel, with questions of Mr. Wong. Um, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move the third round of questions. No, it, it resets for, thank you uh, for that thought, but it resets for each speaker. So, um, okay. thank you, though. So, Councillor Carmel, on the first round with Mr. Wong. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Katarina. So, uh, Mr. Wong, uh, essentially the two questions. One was, uh, does the, your your most current uh, TIA uh, consider the stretch of 16th Avenue between Whispering River Drive and Windermere Road to be a road or a green belt? Uh, we treat it as uh, green belt. It's not a road. So we didn't assign any traffic going through the 16th Avenue. And similarly, uh, same question as earlier, does the site to the south, was that um, uh, where does that fit in your traffic impact assessment? Does, uh, are you capturing both sites or just this one? Uh, we are capturing both sites. So basically we have assumed uh, 60 dwelling unit to the south of this site and then all those traffic has been assigned to the uh, adjacent roadway network. So is it fair to say Mr. Wong that given the, uh, the, the road network today that essentially the, the, all of the traffic from these two sites is likely to drain on to Windermere Road. One way or That's the correct. other, it, find, it finds itself on Windermere Road, correct? That's correct, yeah. Whereas the original roadway network with a, with a proper road along 16th Avenue would have allowed at least this subject site today to uh, essentially drain in a direct way onto Windermere Wind. Is that fair to say? It's, it's 
conjecture, I know, but is that fair to say? Yeah, but because like because of the the multi use uh, the trail uh, to the to the west of us, uh, um, so I we cannot be like assume Sixteenth Avenue can be uh, used for this site. So basically, no, I understand that, but but had it not been turned into a trail, if it was a road today, um, I don't believe I can answer that question. I will have to get the city administration to answer that for you. So. Uh, Along Windermere Road then, essentially all of this traffic comes to the intersection of Windermere Road and Windermere Boulevard uh, in front of the two schools, St. John the 23rd and Constable Daniel Woodall. Uh, are you aware of the very serious concerns that those schools have about the operation of this intersection? Um, so basically we have completed traffic analysis and we would command the city to increase the cycle length of the intersection from 100 second to 130 second. By doing that, we can provide more green time for the southbound left turn um, uh, phase, so that can clear the southbound vehicles like more frequently. Uh, has any consideration been given to increasing the pedestrian cycle along that roadway? Uh, uh, no. Uh, which is the concern of the schools right now? Today, they can't cross that road safely, uh, and more vehicles make it makes uh, makes it less safe, in their view. Uh, I get, I have just a couple more questions. There was, uh, perhaps those are for administration. Uh, that's all my questions for you, Mr. Wong. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Wong? Not seeing any, then, um, we will now turn to hear from those who are in opposition, starting with, uh, Mr. Van Buskirk. Paul and his hair ready to talk. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Colin Van Buster. I'm speaking on behalf of the Windermere North Neighborhood Association. And for information on my experience and also on the association, there's a, uh, a note at the back of this presentation that you re can refer to. There are two key items that I wanted to look at today. The first is for the structure plan, and this rezoning does not facilitate the orderly development of the Windermere neighborhood. The parcel of land in question and the parcel of land to the south are two properties that were open that were orphaned during the uh, development process. The north property was or orphaned by the YMCA that they did not want it, and the south parcel never had a road developed to it. Also, 16th Avenue that went from Whispering River to 170th Street was taken out and turned into a, a walkway or whatever else it's referred to now. The current 16th Avenue that they were talking about today is basically going to be used as a driveway to the, uh, the, the current site in question. But in a uh, orderly development, the most remote areas and locations for to be developed first to put less effect onto the central areas. And with this uh, improper development for the multifamily structures, the construction traffic and all future traffic has to be rooted on existing roads that go through the community. I do have experience doing traffic studies from years ago, and it was a good exercise just to look at this again. And I looked at the study, looking at what it was done for, if it was done along the routes of uh, drivability and not as expected roadways for the uh, most uh, direct route. And also I use traffic information that is a little bit uh, probably more conservative than what some others have used. Uh, normally they use 10 vehicles per, uh, per household per generation. I've used eight for single family dwellings and six for uh, multifamily dwellings. There's three key areas that I looked at for the traffic study. The first is Whitelaw Drive on the north route. And this residential road was designed for 1,000 vehicles per day. And right now it serves Windermere North and West Point communities, and that volume is up to 1,700 per day. If the two parcels of land were to develop, the south would add another 600, and the one requesting rezoning would add another 1,000 vehicles. So that would bring the total 
vehicles to about 3,300 over the north route of Whitewad Drive, which is 3.3 times of the design capacity. So that was my first concern over the Whitewad Drive north route. The Windermere Road traffic past the schools, that's another concern. It was designed as a four-lane collector road with mitigation. However, with parking on one side and school stopping on the other, this road becomes a two-lane collector road designed for about 10,000 vehicles per day. I must note that the employees at the Windermere Plaza have been told to use on-street parking to reserve the on-site parking for the business customers. The traffic generated within the neighborhood is calculated to be over 9,000 vehicles per day without adding any school traffic from other communities. If these parcels of land were to develop, the south would add another 700 vehicles per day and the north would add 1,000 vehicles a day. This brings the total to well over 11,000. So with the K-6 and the K-9 schools and the community playground, they shouldn't be on such a high traffic route. Also note that the AMA does not support school patrols near the intersection of Windermere Road and Windermere Boulevard. And as of my last count, the number of signs on Windermere Road path through the school zone comes to 146. So the number of signs alone indicates there's a problem of some kind. The other road that I looked at was the actual intersection going north from Windermere Road to Windermere Boulevard. And there was that trans uh, transportation impacts assessment that was done at the end of last year on it. As previously stated, Windermere Road is used as a two-lane collector road with a design capacity of 10,000 vehicles per day. And at this location, the projected traffic past the school is increased by another, well, by over 5,000 vehicles per day. And this total brings up to 60% above the actual design recommendations. And to help avoid this intersection on the north leg, a lot of the traffic has been going through Windermere Wind, and right now there's a plan in place to install traffic lights at the intersection of Windermere Wind and Windermere Boulevard. So again, just to sum it up, my uh, two concerns are the orderly development of the neighborhood, and also those three key points for high traffic areas. Uh, I did attach the uh, actual traffic study to the presentation, so that information is available for yourselves. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions, Councillor Carmel? Uh, yes, just a couple. Thank you for your presentation today, sir. Uh, I, I guess I, uh, you've spoken a lot about projections and volumes and that kind of thing. Can you, uh, I guess, briefly just outline what expertise you have in this area? Well, I started my engineering career quite a few years ago. And I was working for the uh, Alberta government. So that's where I'm, I do have old information for experience, but uh, I've done quite a few traffic studies during my time. And this was actually a good exercise for an update. You spoke to um, the uh, traffic volume projections and essentially the number of trips generated by these two, uh, these two properties. Uh, can you just outline again uh, what uh, would be code prescribed or what would be generally accepted numbers versus the numbers you used for those generations? Uh, normally they use about 10 vehicle trips per day per household. But since they're both multifamily, I've reduced that to uh, about six. Now, okay. go ahead. I was going to just ask if there's a, buried in that change that you've made, is there a presumption that there's a transit service or that there's fewer trips generated for multifamily developments? Or you know, on what basis would you make that reduction? Uh, multifamily, they usually don't make as many trips per household because they, a lot of them fit together easy to get their neighbors to get along so they, they plan trips together a little bit more. Where some of the information does maybe fall apart is we don't have good information on, I guess a lot of people buying from Amazon or other delivery trucks and that has reduced uh, household traffic but at the same time increased the uh, commercial type traffic. 
Uh, yeah, good point. I don't know that any of us have a lens on that right now. Uh, I believe that's all my questions for you, sir. Thank you for your presentation today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Van Buskirk? Mr. Van Buskirk? Pardon me. Not seeing any. Then uh, David Honstein is next. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'll uh, switch on my uh, my camera here so everybody can uh, see who who is uh, speaking. Uh, am I coming through uh, through okay? Um, yep. We've got your presentation up, right? Uh, actually, I don't have a presentation. That would be uh, for my wife. She's going to be doing a separate presentation later. Okay, we'll pin you to the screen then, and then uh, <laughs> we'll make sure her presentation's visible when she's up. So go ahead, sir. Sure. Thank Thank you very much, and uh, you know, glad glad to be uh, taking part in this uh, in this public hearing. And uh, you know, I guess uh, good afternoon. My name is David Honstein. I'm an eight-year resident of uh, Windermere North. I've I have approximately 20 years of experience working as a regulatory representative in industry and having to apply present and respond to reviews of applications. Further to this, for 14 years, I was involved in, with regulatory bodies in the territories where I chaired public technical review meetings and took part in public hearings. I would like to provide some comment to the city's application review process today, as well, a few, as, well as a few comments on the uh, uh, updated uh, TIA uh, 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 amendment that was provided. So concern, concern, my concerns with the application review process, the application proceeded to, review state, to a review stage without the proper complete information available for this review of the city planner as well as the public and finally city council. Some concerns in the public process I include are the actual application documents for rezoning the subject property from AG to DC1 are not available for public review. The traffic impact assessment was not finalized by the consultant and should not have been made available for review until it was finalized. Even though the city went ahead with the public engagement session on September 24th, 2019 and solicited comments on the application and proposal, the TIA was not finalized and still remains on the city planning applications webpage as a draft. I provided my comments again with a separate submission to the city clerk for this hearing and for the councillor's reference. As only a few of my many noted concerns were addressed in, in that uh, uh, amendment. A decision on any application based on a draft document is concerning. Further in the process, the public engagement session on September 24th was basically a pre-showing of the application, something that did not in any way resemble a public information session. There was no presentation from the applicant, no presentation from the city, and no opportunity for community engagement except to individually interact with the applicant, applicant's consultant and the city representatives. As there were, was a recorded 75 individuals in attendance at that session over a two hour period, this would only allow each individual approximately two and a half minutes with each the applicant and the city representative. Not a lot of time to ask questions and get answers or even understand the project. If everyone had time to take had to take the time to review the display boards, their, the time would be less as everyone would be using the initial time to read. Following the public engagement, the city prepared a what we heard report, which contained responses and concern, to the concerns and recommendations for, an up, for the update to the TIA. This updated TIA only addressed three items of concern, traffic at Windermere Boulevard, Windermere Road, school issues and traffic, a traffic review on Whitelaw Drive. Many of the errors, inaccuracies, and, and uh, omissions of the draft report were not addressed. And as I mentioned, it still remains in draft. Although new information, the TIA amendment dated April 27, 2020, was not provided in, in advance for review of concerned residents and is only being addressed at the final public hearing on the application today. This is not a fair pro public pr review process. A notice of public hearing was sent to area property owners, as mentioned uh, in the, uh, I believe, in one of the previous presentations. Most residents received this notice in the mail on August 21st, some not until August 24th, only seven to, days seven to ten days prior to the hearing. This is not adequate notice time, 
and does not allow time to properly review the information available, let alone pre prepare a response for administration and city council. Most public reviews I'm familiar with allow at least 21 days to, 31 day to 30 days for review, depending on the extent of the application. Further to the short review period and having read through the documentation provided to city council by the administration and the hearing agenda, it is very disturbing to see that the city administration, as it has with most of the items on this agenda, in its report to council has already concluded and recommends the city council approve to approve this application. With documents already prepared, I say disturbing because in a proper fair review process, city council and administration should hear the concerns of interested persons prior to any decision being recommended, and especially in approval. What exactly are we here for today? If I've got time, I'd like to mention a couple comments on the uh, city's uh, administration report. The recommendation and justification section included three points, including that the administration is in support of this application because, one, it will expand the variety of housing choices in the Windermere neighborhood. My response to that is no, it will not. It will only increase the number of medium density housing units available in a far to reach area of the neighborhood. Number two, it will co um, be compatible with surrounding planned uses. Sorry, Mr. Hanstein, I've, I've got a stop you there as the five minutes has elapsed, but there may be some, uh, some further questions for you. So, sure, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Sure, Councillor Carmel. Thank you, uh, Mayor Abison. So uh, thank you again for being here today, Mr. Hanstein. I, uh, first question to you is, I just wanna confirm uh, uh, your comment around the publicly available documents. I, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that uh, the documents being considered today were not available to the public on the website. Uh, am, am I reading that correctly? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. My reference was simply to the application documents. So there was no available application documents to be reviewed. The only, the only documents available were the, uh, uh, the TIA reports and then the uh, city's... Uh, uh, I think it was what we heard report uh, summarizing the uh, the information at the uh, public meeting back a year ago, September. And you, the TIA report that was available is is the one we're talking about today. That's correct. And as I mentioned, uh, as far as I know, the draft report has never been finalized. It is still on the city's website as the draft report. Although the link says it's a final report, the the report actually is still a draft report. Right. And the, and the uh, uh, TIA amendment only addressed uh, three items of concern. Uh, there is, um, how shall I put this? I guess there's a, there's a bit of a, perhaps a tone or, or a, a theme that, um, while it's recognized that there's some traffic challenges in Upper Windermere, while there's uh, it's recognized that these sites are somewhat remote from the access uh, streets from Windermere Boulevard, etc. That it's not the fault of this property that Windermere is the way it is today. You know, so we can we can speak a little bit in technicalities in terms of TIAs and, and precision of numbers, or we can talk a little bit about uh, numbers of units or, or changes to the system. But I guess more practically speaking, what's your view on that? Like, uh, if we're talking about a, a, a property, property or even a pair of properties that is essentially screened from the rest of the neighborhood by virtue of the wooded lots, um, which yes, is gonna add some traffic, but is not the tip, it, it, it is not the thing creating the traffic problems. What's your view on that? Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Cartmel. I, I, I do agree that it's, it's not the only thing uh, that's contributing to traffic problems. Unfortunately, the traffic problems are what they are right now, and they are bad. Uh, as was indicated in, uh, I believe, uh, a previous presentation, and uh, I think uh, some of the information that's been provided to the city in the past, uh, the traffic in the area, the area is still not uh, fully built out, accepting this uh, this uh, proposed uh, uh, application and the, and the one to the south of it. And there are incredible traffic issues with getting to and from Windermere uh, Boulevard and the uh, Twilliger and Anthony Hendy. When I, uh, when I bought here, 
The, uh, the signs out on, uh, on Windermere uh, Boulevard indicated uh, 15 minutes to the airport. Now it takes me 15 to 20 minutes to get from my home just to Twilliger Drive or the Anthony Handy. It, it is not uh, conducive to, uh, to uh, safe and, and efficient travel. And unfortunately, the, uh, the uh, traffic is uh, running overboard into uh, one at Windermere. The, uh, the school traffic uh, is, is using uh, uh, Ware Crescent. They're also using it for parking, for dropping off their kids. Staff is also using it as I've uh, witnessed uh, vehicles being parked there throughout the day. And, you know, they show up in the morning, they leave in the afternoon. Uh, it's, it's pretty bad. So, so what do we do? I mean, we've got a couple of pieces of land that are, that we're literally always intended to be developed in one way or another. Uh, we have landowners that, that also have, uh, you know, their right, so to speak, to develop that land. Uh, and I'm not dismissing or, or minimizing any of the impacts that you've outlined, but you know, what's, what's the right outcome here then? What's the right answer? I'm, I'm not sure if I'm the one that should be answering that question. Uh, I do have my views. Uh, my wife will be speaking uh, a little bit later and, uh, and she's got uh, views of her own uh, that, that I totally agree with. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, the landowner, the current landowners picked up that property I would say in a sweet deal from uh, from the YMCA, the the original landowners donated it because they they were not going to be utilizing it. The uh, YMCA sat on it for quite some time, and it is just not in a good place. It's uh, it's outside of the general Windermere North area, and uh, the access is limited. If they could put a direct access to the uh, Anthony Hendy or Twilliger Drive, fantastic, but that's not possible. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you for your presentation, sir. Thank you, everybody. Any other questions for Mr. Hanstein? Not seeing any. Then we'll now hear from Rose Hanstein. And now you'd like the presentation? Oh, good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. Um, I do have a presentation that's up on the screen. Yeah, we can see uh, it. Proceed. Uh, so I'm, I'm a licensed land agent. I've been in the land industry for 40 years. I've managed the land departments for all of the major utilities in Edmonton. Um, so I, and, and I'm also a mom, so I'm going to be a little bit more emotional about this because our safety and our livability in the community is, is really, really poor right now. So my question is, how much is too much? Next slide, please. So we, we are families, we have young children, we are seniors that have built our, our retirement dream homes. We make mortgage payments, we pay our taxes. All we're wanting is to create a community where we can have fun and live. Um, next slide, please. Our, our wants are pretty basic. We want what we had when we were growing up. We were able to play in our front yards. We were able to ride our bikes. We were able to, to walk to and from school. And, and all we want is a safe community for our families. Next slide, please. The community in a, as a whole, everyone we speak to is struggling. We're angry, we're frustrated, we're fearful. The high density development, the noise levels, the poor ingress, egress, overwhelming high tra volumes of traffic, frustrated drivers that race down our streets, c poor community livability. This new application pull puts our frustrations to a whole new level. And it won't just be us. The people who move into the new developments, they're going to feel equally frustrated. Next slide, please. So I won't touch upon this too much because everybody else spoke about it, but we have an eight foot fence to the southwest. We have a ravine to the north. We have a ravine in the river to the west. We have only one point of ingress, egress for the community. It's a very, very strong safety concern. Next slide, please. For desktop exercise, emergency evacuation. If the river valley, to the west was on fire and parents rushed to the schools to rescue their children. How do we evacuate 1,653 residences 
two schools, and 83 businesses with one-way roadways and one evacuation point. Next slide, please. How is it acceptable that we have only one evacuation point for the entire community and we have to compete with the community to the south? Commercial aircraft, schools, buses, commercial buildings, institutions, etc., all have safety protocols. Next slide, please. Would you fly on an airplane that has only one emergency exit and no evacuation plan? Next slide, please. Would the City of Edmonton approve that 100 unit apartment building with only one door? Next slide, please. Never say never. 1979 Mill Woods fought explosion and fire, 1987 Sherwood Park, 2007 McEwen fire, 2016 Fort McMurray. The, the, our, our safety is significantly compromised. Next slide, please. How would we evacuate? What is the city's plan? How will emergency vehicles access our community on one car roadways while everyone is trying to evacuate? Where do we go when only a escape route is the roads are impassable? Will the elderly, mobile impaired, and families with their small children and pets in tow be forced to evacuate on foot? Would, what would we do in the winter months with snow drifts, windrows, flesh freezing temperatures, and will families have to jump the eight foot perimeter community fence to evacuate? How many will perish and how will the city handle the thousands of homeless? I'm gonna skip forward because um, I'm gonna run out of time here, but I'd like to show, if you can go several slides forward, our lake is flowing from the development and we have significant volumes of trucks all day long, 12 hours a day going in front. Um, if you could go one slide, for, I, I believe it's one slide further, just so we can see the water volumes in our lake. Another slide, please. This has become the new typical. And in the, one of the last two hour rainfalls, the water rose 52 inches above normal. An additional 10 inches will submerge the pathway, 17 inches would flood our gardens and yards, and 25 inches will flood our homes. We are in an absolute crisis mode where people can't even walk on the sidewalks anymore. People bike adults as well as children bike on the sidewalks because our roads are so treacherous. And these are things that at the current state need to be fixed. This is not add in a few more houses. And, and it, it, you know, it's like, I apologize for being so emotional, but the mothers in this community are fearful and frustrated for our children. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. So, thank you. Councillor Carmel, questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Honstein, for uh, your presentation today. Uh, so first of all, the image that's on the screen, can you tell me which lake that is? That is the lake that's right behind White Law Drive. We live on White Law Drive. Oh yeah, okay. And um, that is the lake, and all summer long, I was monitoring the water levels and I was taking pictures and each and every rainfall is quite similar. The trees around the lake are falling over dead or dying because the water is flooding it all out right now. We got up the laser level and we took measurements and um, you know, like I say, our homes, we're fearful our homes are gonna get flooded. Does that um, is that a this year phenomenon or has that been happening over a period of years? Do you have uh, insight on that? Um, so so what, one thing that I've noted over the last eight years is more houses, more roofs, more pavement equals more runoff. As the, as the development has increased, the water levels have steadily increased and this has been the new norm for this summer. It was bad last year, but this, this summer is to a new, a new level. So I'll ask you a question that I asked earlier. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget of who, but that, you know, there's, there is 
some discussion that this is a relatively modest increase in the number of living units in this neighborhood and that, uh, you know, while there's no question, it's certainly no question in my mind that the traffic network here is severely challenged, that these two properties really won't change it that much, that it's not, quote unquote, is not the fault of these two properties that we have such a challenge in front of us. Uh, you know, your thoughts on that? Well, August 13th, our worst fears were realized. A child was hit on their bike in front of the schools. And that traffic will not help that situation. And I had put forth an, an idea and a recommendation for, for those two lands. I understand that, you know, this is not the fault of their own. If the city could broker um, a deal that perhaps we could form a, an, um, a society, they could donate the lands and gain a tax benefit from it, and it could be turned into community parkland. Because right now, if you look at our community, we have no place for recreation. You can't comfortably walk our streets. You can't comfortably bike on our streets. The lake is at such a, a terrible slope. There is no recreational land around the lake. The only place for, where anybody could go is the schoolyard. And that's not a walking recreation place. Um, the ideal would be if that could be made a recreation area for our and other communities where people can walk their dogs. Right now, nobody, nobody plays in the, like, I do not see any children playing or having any type of recreation in this community. And as a mother, it breaks my heart. Um, Mr. Honstein made reference to the fact that there's a lot of other uh, um, housing choices in the general neighborhood. There's, there's other multifamily uh, uh, developments. Is it fair to say that those tend to be concentrated around the amenity areas? Uh, near the superstore, near the current development, et cetera? Yes. And is there much by way of amenities up in, up in these two properties? Uh, uh, in other words, is it fair to say that most residents will have to leave this area to do virtually anything? Yes, it's actually 1.2 kilometers from the school, so the children would have to be driven to school. They could not walk there. Uh, and transit is not particularly good, although it's uh, understood that it may improve with the network redesign, at least in terms of hours of service. Um, do you have any thoughts on transit service within the Windermere neighborhood? Well, my understanding was is that it's a little bit too narrow for buses to turn on the corner. And I just might add that right now on White Law Drive, it is extremely difficult to back your car off your driveway. There's, there's, it's happened to me three times now where I have backed out onto the road and while I am waiting to turn to go forward, someone comes around and almost hits me. Three times people have gone up on the sidewalk because they've almost hit me. Uh, that's my time. Thank you for your presentation today, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions for uh, Ms. Honstein? Okay, not seeing any. Um, we will turn now to questions of administration. Councillor Carmel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, my questions, I think, uh, for the most part, will uh, focus on the traffic impacts. Um, now, first of all, I understand that uh, the city did intend to uh, make improvements to the signals at uh, the intersection of Windermere Road and Windermere Boulevard and the intersection of Windermere Wind and Windermere Boulevard. Can you confirm that and timing on that? Yes, comes from Cartmel. Uh, the, the intersection at Windermere Wind and Windermere Boulevard is uh, up for signalization and that is expected to happen uh, this year. Uh, you heard a number of concerns uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding traffic, uh, can you speak a little bit about the traffic volume projections that were contained in the uh, traffic impact assessment? Uh, and specifically, I'm wondering uh, 
if they if they match up in a neighborhood that has uh, very little, if if any, meaningful transit support and, and uh, service. Sure. Um, so the traffic projections uh, were done not only for uh, uh, the site, uh, um, the proposed site, but also looking at um, uh, some of the other uh, lands that are uh, that can that will be developed in future that are already zoned uh, in Windermere area further north. Uh, so all in all, uh, about uh, uh, over 300 units were considered to be developed uh, and uh, the traffic was generated uh, based on the type of development that is expected. For instance, uh, for the subject site, uh, RA7 rates were used, whereas there, is, there are some uh, um, uh, single family housing uh, that can be developed in the area, so appropriate rates were used for that. Um, as far as transit is concerned, uh, uh, knowing that uh, um, uh, access to transit is uh, uh, challenging, uh, as you mentioned, there will be enhancement uh, through daily service, uh, uh, increase in the service hours, but uh, uh, there was no discount done for transit as such. Uh, the assumption was that every uh, trip will be made uh, through vehicle and uh, 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 not through transit. Um, those, those are some high-level uh, highlights on, on how the traffic generation was used. So uh, I, I want to share with you my observations uh, over the last few years on Windermere Road right in front of the two schools, St. John the 23rd and Constable Woodall. And I understand that the projections speak to numbers and road capacities and cycle times and the like, and I, I respect that. However, um, I guess in the form of a question, do you consider uh, those school time months when a windrow is essentially filling one lane in each direction on that road and they're, you know, so the capacity is much reduced uh, and with that windrow crossing of children that are being dropped off is severely challenged. Um, do we compensate for that? Uh, the short answer is no, but uh, in terms of its snow clearing, uh, the priority is given to bus routes and uh, Windermere Road is a bus route. So our expectation is that uh, uh, the snow is cleared through that area. But uh, as you said, um, there is significant amount of traffic that is turning left at that intersection. And uh, I appreciate your comment regarding congestion there. Well, you know, that you're right. Uh that the snow is cleared, but it's cleared to the curb. And in that, in that period of time with two schools when everyone's dropping off their, their children, uh, the roadway has literally no quote unquote lanes. Uh, one lane's filled with snow, the next lane's filled with parked cars. And all of this traffic is draining down a road in the dark where there's elementary school children trying to cross that road. It is a uh, a conspiracy of circumstances that is profoundly dangerous. Uh, and I don't see anything about this development that says that it doesn't get worse because we're going to have more cars. You said yourself that every trip from these sites is going to be a car trip, not a transit trip. Uh, not likely a walking or bicycling trip. So does it make sense to compound this problem with 175 units on this site and however many units on the associated site, which will be freed up by virtue of this rezoning. So just to bring in perspective, uh, this site alone will be adding 40 vehicles at the intersection in the AM peak and uh, sorry, uh, yes. Well, for the left end movement. Uh, and in general, it's uh, in the realm of about 70 vehicles overall. Uh, my time is up, thank you. I'll need a second round, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Henderson on the first round. Yeah, I'm, I'm just really puzzled um, about how the roadway system ended up this way. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm back, I'm actually looking at the NSP um, and what our expectations were, because it strikes me as is odd that um, part of this sounds like it's being created because both of the east-west connectors, uh, collectors, um, have been converted to multi-use trails. 
um, which means that you know essentially the Windermere Wind is just not accessible at all from anybody on the western portion of the or the eastern portion of the uh, neighborhood. And I just curious to know how we ended up there. So the NSP was approved in 2006 and uh, the original version of the NSP does contemplate uh, a shared use path connection yeah. uh, along 16 Avenue Road right of way. Um, I don't have details of uh, why of, uh, or a scenario if a scenario was analyzed with and without uh, that connection to Wittemere Wind. Yeah, because that because it because the other piece where you could get across, to my eye, is is white. Well, there's White Law Gate and Ware Gate that again has a a way through, but it's multi-use as well. So there's really no way to go from. There's no way to get to Wind Windermere Wind from from that um, eastern portion of the neighborhood because of those two because those two neither of those connections are there. So was that intended? Was that part of the original plan of the neighborhood? Do we know? That was uh, the uh, that is the plan uh, approved in 2006. Yes. Okay. Because and I and I hear you that this is going to be a you know that and this is one of the, it seems to me and I just your thinking on this would be useful. Um, you know, this particular change, I think, would be incremental compared to the, you know, there's significant development looks like it's still to go in there. So the choice we make here is, is not going to, is a small part of the problem that sounds like it may have been created here. So I'm, you know, I'm just, um, I, I, that's why I'm, I don't know what the answers are, um, uh, but it, it looks like it just it just seems like an odd plan, and I just wonder what your thinking is about how you could how it could be repaired. I think Councillor Carmel's point's well taken that this is not really an issue for this development. There's a there's a larger planning issue here in terms of the transportation corridors. It sounds that isn't working. So we are looking at it uh, from a staged approach. The first stage being uh, uh, signalizing a Windermere wind. Uh, to provide uh, two signalized access to the area. Uh, we have done traffic safety review along uh, Windermere Road, um, and uh, that was done back in 2018, um, and a number of uh, safety measures were implemented. Um, we have also looked at uh, improvements, uh, and one of the uh, uh, improvement is looking at the signal timings, uh, uh, which can be increased. Uh, to provide more uh, green time uh, for the left and southbound left and vehicles at this intersection during uh, the AM and PM peak. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there could be potential for looking at a double left and we do have road right of way, but that is something that uh, we would first want to review the area and monitor uh, before we get into a detailed exercise of uh, looking at reconfiguring the intersection um, uh, uh, at uh, Windermere Road and uh, Windermere Boulevard. So is there is there any contemplation of converting one of the right-of-ways that, that are currently not, I mean, I hate to ask this question because I, you know, I love the fact, you know, the pedestrian connections are important, but is there any contemplation of, of using either the right-of-ways that are currently multi-use trails as a way of connecting Allowing allowing two accesses out for that for that eastern portion. No, we are not looking at that. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, even the NSPTIA did, did contemplate uh, the yeah. network, and it does identify that these roadways will be uh, experiencing um, um, higher volumes uh, uh, because of the constrained access. Okay. So the advantage, the advantage of connecting Windermere Wind with new traffic signals will serve the part of the neighborhood that's still building up further north. It's not going to solve the problem on, on, on the eastern portion, I'm guessing, because it's hard to get to. Would that be fair to say? It will at least provide some opportunity to disperse the traffic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm out of time. Thanks. Councillor Banga? Thank you. A uh, couple questions there. Uh, one is uh, in the recommendation uh, uh, supporting 
the application. It says compatible with the surrounding area use. How is that? Uh, what, what is that uh, comment based on? So what is that comment based on? Thank you, Councillor Banga. Well, when we look at compatibilities for land uses, we, we uh, make com uh, comparables or comparables to built form, scope, scale, density. And so in, in this case, when we say uh, um, the site's compatible, it is basically built on the same development regulation as the RA7 site to the south. Uh, in fact, it's even more restricted as far as density, but the built forms are very much uh, very similar and very much the same. Um, and another part of compatibility relates to transition um, between different areas and different land uses. So for example, transitions of height from apartments to lower density. Um, from a planning and urban design perspective, we like to see a gentle transition wherever we can possibly achieve that. In this case, the transition is provided by nature in the form of the ravine where we've got multi-unit housing separated from lower density by a natural area. So uh, that factors into compatibility as far as impact um, between different built forms or land uses. Okay, and uh, one of the speakers uh, expressed uh, concern about uh, the water level in the lake. Uh, there is a ravine or wooded area in the middle. Uh, does anybody know that uh, that this development will add to the problem if there is a problem. Who does the drainage problem? Uh, I guess analysis. I'll ask Mr. Uh, Jitinder Tawana to address that question, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Banga, the, uh, the water from uh, this development or the whole area was uh, uh, is go it goes to the stormwater management facility. This has been as per the original design. It does not go to the ravine. Uh, the stormwater management facility itself is a very, very conservative design. Uh, we design it to a 100-year flood level. Uh, the biggest known storm uh, that could impact is a 1978 storm. Uh, that has also been considered in the design of this. The high water level is uh, outside the property line. Uh, which is, uh, and uh, and uh, the speaker also mentioned as regards the pond filling up, that's normal. In the most common storms, we would expect the pond to empty to the normal water level in about three days time. That is because of the restrictive, restricted discharge rate that we implement on these stormwater management facilities. Uh, so that the dust particles or the sed sediment, sediments could settle down. Okay, and my final question is about the park space. Um, there was mentioned that uh, there is no park space. How is that the park space in this area as compared to the other areas of town? City. Hi, Councillor. I, uh, I don't have the data in front of me right now, um, but the as far as from, from a neighborhood perspective, um, school, park, school sites and park sites are factored into that. We make uh, a recreational use of the amenity space around the storm ponds. Um, this particular neighborhood also is uh, located nearby the River Valley, and in many cases we, we try to uh, develop pathways and ravine and with, along the ravine systems as part of a recreational network. Um, we can get back to you offline about how this neighborhood compares to other neighborhoods. Uh, I don't have that data with me at the moment. Thank you. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So if I listened to Councillor Henderson's questions correctly, he was asking about the multi-use trail uh, in the other direction. I want to ask about from what I'm seeing on the neighborhood structure plan on 16th Ave extending the other direction. Uh, there seem to be a lot of maps in the NSP that suggest, and I don't know how it would have worked, but that it looked like the road was going to extend somehow 
on the other side of the Hende. Um, so number one, am I misreading these maps? And uh, let's let's start there. Maybe I'm just misreading it. No, the road was always um, it, it, uh, meant to be within within the neighborhood, um, and the extension is east of the Whispering Way. Uh, that is just the extension of the local connection. I see. So okay, just it's not as clear as I would have thought on that. Okay, so the only maybe the other question because I think all the other ones are asked is a few probably a couple of years ago we had had uh, an application in a different part of the city in a, in a new and developing area. And there were a number of concerns expressed about uh, permitting further development until there was either an interim traffic solution in place. Um, and I'm curious, and it was suggested at that time that uh, the city would look a little more critically at that. So, so it's one thing to be allowed to rezone a property, but it would be something entirely different for us to start issuing permits until there's an appropriate resolution to different concerns. Are we still applying that thinking in new areas where, where that is a legitimate issue, which this appears to be? Thank you, Councillor. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, try to answer that and I'll ask for some help from Mr. Saeed. Uh, Typically, um, the most common reason for putting limitations on development would be, uh, in, in my experience, have been on a transportation basis or if, if a drainage um, service cannot be adequately provided. Uh, the most common point in the development process where that would occur would be the subdivision stage. So zoning typically is dealt with first to uh, deal with the land uses. And then quite often when the land is subdivided and the roadways created and the parcels created, uh, sometimes conditions are attached to those subdivisions that additional roadways have to be upgraded in order to provide sufficient access um, to those areas. And it becomes part of the servicing agreement and it's legally required at that point before those subdivisions can be registered. And then that precedes, of course, when development permits could be issued. So that's standard, the, how the standard process unfolds in that regard. And we do have a number of subdivisions in the Southwest that have conditions of uh, improvements and upgrades to Ellerslie Road and, and uh, larger roadway services into those areas before those areas can be developed. Mm -hmm. I, what I'm, I guess I'm wondering is that, uh, I'm familiar with some of those other ones. I know there was also one in the Northwest part of the city where we're dealing with a similar set of challenges. But with this one being that there's not meant to be any other access points out, would it even be reasonable to have a condition like that? And, and I, I feel it's important to ask that question because that really does impact the incremental ability uh, of this to influence traffic. So w would we be even able to do that in, in an NSP that is currently designed the way it is for this particular area? Um, my initial answer would be not in this case. Uh, in particular, the, the concept is uh, is relevant, but in this particular case, um, in dealing with my colleague, Mr. Saeed, the, the uh, trip generations, the traffic generated uh, from these sites was anticipated and designed as part of the original TIA when the original neighborhood was approved back in 2006. So, so capacity has been accounted for um, from a technical perspective. Um, so it would be challenging to do that without sterilizing the land um, as a consequence uh, at this stage or at a later stage in development for, for other potential areas. Okay. Um, no, I think that's it then. Those are all my questions. Uh, if you need me to move a second round, Mr. Merrick, I think Councillor Cartmill is looking. Yes. Please. I'll move that then. Seconder. Second. Councillor Henderson, thank you very much. I'll just seek unanimous consent. Is there any objection to another round? Not hearing any, then Councillor Cartmel, carry on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wonder if it's possible to put Mr. Heinrich's uh, uh, presentation back up. Clerk should be able to do that. Was there a particular slide? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't remember the number. It was towards the end and it, it, it showed, I think believe Mr. Heinrich's comment at the time was that it showed um, the roadway network superimposed on the neighborhood or something to that effect. Uh, 
Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, perhaps the one before this, the slide before this. Now, you'll note that on this map, it says 16th Avenue, uh, right on the white line that is between Whispering River and Windermere Road. And so I guess my question is, I'm, I'm not sure of when the NSP was approved or perhaps it was updated, but judging from the city's own map and judging from all of the material that was distributed during the sales of homes in this neighborhood, which some of uh, our constituents have shared with me, that was a road and now it's not. So I guess asking again, when did it go from being a road to not being a road? Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think the answer, historically, it is uh, a road right of way. Uh, in fact, if you look farther to the east, on the east side of Anthony Hende, you can kind of see remnants of that road right of way of one of the original government road allowances that were uh, spanned across the country running north and south. Yeah. So as it sits today, that uh, shared use path, multi-use trail portion is uh, still uh, legally road right of way. It is not a titled parcel. And it was identified as multi-use trail at the very beginning uh, when this plan was approved, first approved in 2006. And it's not unusual to have multi-use trails as part of a, a road right of way, walkways and uh, multi-use trails are quite common and uh, commonly and often used um, to accommodate uh, walkways and shared use paths, which uh, ultimately are a transportation function. And if Mr. Uh, Saeed has anything to add, I invite him to do so here. Well, Mr. I, I, I understand, I accept what you're saying, uh, Mr. Heinrichs, and what Mr. Saeed said earlier. Uh, and I'm not trying to belabor the point. However, if that was a road and had remained a road, there would be an east to west spine road leading directly to Windermere Boulevard by virtue of Windermere Wind that would not cross in front of those schools. That would be a more direct route. So I'm finding it with all due respect, and I mean that sincerely, I'm finding it very hard to believe that that wasn't intended to be the road for the neighborhood and it no longer is. I guess there's not much more you can offer than what you yeah, have. Yeah, that, that's a fair observation. Um, I, I'm not familiar with the history in 2006 as to why the original plan uh, did not require that or identify that as a um, vehicular roadway instead of a uh, pedestrian walkway. Nor I. Um, a couple more quick questions then. I heard in the original presentation something with respect to 40 kilometer speed limits. Uh, I think we've heard that the major concern here is in front of the schools, which already have playground zones. So uh, does the application of 40 kilometer speed limits really pertinent to this conversation? I'll ask Mr. C to comment on that. That was more pertinent to the residential, other residential roads, specifically White Law Drive, which uh, came up as uh, as a concern uh, from the residents. Uh, so that was the context of uh, 40k speed. I thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Saeed. Uh, and I just want to confirm what I heard in in response to Councillor Banga's question. The what we're seeing, what has been observed, that the stormwater retention pond is expected. Is that fair to say? Just quickly. Yes. Uh, that's all of my questions for administration, Mr. Mayor. I, I would like to ask some questions of our uh, speakers on their new information, if that's possible. Certainly. We'll, we'll come to that uh, after the break. Um, Councillor Henderson, if you could take the chair. I will take the chair. So the, um, uh, the roadway network that's laid out in the NSP doesn't go to the local roads. It just sets out the collectors usually and and obviously the arterials but um would th this was not outlined it's part of the circulation for pedestrians but it's not included as part of the if it was a spine road it would have been at least a collector in the in the neighborhood structure plan is that fair correct okay um so i haven't gone back into the uh, uh nsp to to see how it does fit, but would there have been a road closure bylaw or is it still 
technically road right of way because it's being used for circulation, albeit non-vehicular. It's still technically uh, road right of way, and it doesn't need to be closed because it is uh, non-vehicle circulation. Okay, so there. Okay, so it's still sort of in the inventory, uh, and with an NSP change and public engagement, theoretically, a road could be built there. However, I think the, all the folks backing onto the greenway might have something to say about that. It's probably a fair assumption. Okay. Um, so, and, and I know the bind. I've been in here uh, during rush hour, and, and it is very, very challenging, no doubt. So, so I'm sympathetic to all those concerns. I, I just uh, wanted to chase down a little bit the, the heritage of this 16th Avenue as, a, as an option. I mean, clearly some mitigations are necessary for the existing um, situation, and maybe the signalizations will, will uh, and, and signal uh, timing changes will help. Um, but those are, rightly, those are um, distinct considerations from the land use considerations here, albeit accumulative impacts on top of that is a valid consideration. But we're not in a position to give direction today about signalization and, and, uh, and, and turning times. That's, a, that's council in a different function, yes? Correct. I think what may, may help the cumulative impacts uh, discussion is the fact that what is being proposed today it actually has a less of a traffic impact than what currently exists for the zoning. So the institutional use that is outright permitted today on the site will have a greater transportation impact than the proposed DC-1 that's modeled after the RA-7. So the, the, the cut and thrust is that the zoning change at least, or pardon me, the designation change, because the zoning's AG, but the designation's institutional. And Correct. so the designation change in the NSP, uh, strictly speaking, is a reduction in impacts, not from today, but a reduction from what's permitted or what uh, rights that are granted today, at least at the, at the statutory plan level. Correct. Okay. Um, and, and zoning would still be required for institutional use here, and that was being pursued. It was abandoned for any number of reasons, uh, traffic being one, but, but um, notwithstanding, um, it would be compliant with the NSP to, to apply for a higher intensity use on this site than what is proposed. Correct. Okay. Okay, so, okay, I think that's... Just understanding how the impacts question uh, fits into this from a sort of statutory and regulatory point of view is really helpful. So I'll leave it there, uh, take the chair back. We're at 3.30 now, so I suggest we take the break uh, and then uh, we'll shift to new information. Um, I'll, I'll just double check. Were there any other questions for administration or are we safe to shift to new information at 3.45? So I suspect there'll be a bit of work to do, otherwise I'd try to power through, but uh, Let's, let's recess now as we normally would for the next 15 and then we'll pick up new information at 345. And let's try to be back 345 sharp. Thanks.
We'll roll call in 30 seconds. Okay, welcome back. Uh, I will start this time with Councillor McKean. I am here, Mr. Mayor. Welcome, Councillor Nichol. Present. Hello, Councillor Paquette. I'm here. Welcome back, Councillor Walters. I'm back. Thank you, Councillor Banga. How about Councillor Cartmel? I am here, Mr. Mayor. Welcome back, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. I am here. Welcome, Councillor Essinger. I am here. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Present. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Yep. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon, I'm here. And uh, Councillor Banga, are you there? I'm here. Great. Okay, that's everybody. So. Let's resume uh, now under new information. So um, is there uh, new information uh, from Ms. Summers? I have no information, new information, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Councillor Carmel, did you have questions for uh, Ms. Summers or for the other um, applicant representatives? Uh, for the speakers in opposition. Oh, for the speakers in opposition. Pardon me. Okay. Yep. Uh, Mr. Uh, Nizar Samji, did you have any new information? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Alim Samji, did you have any new information? Uh, no, nothing from me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wong, how about you? Any new information? Uh, nothing from me, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Van Buskirk, anything arising from what's been said so far? Uh, no, I don't have anything new to add. Okay. Councillor Carmel, did you have questions for Mr. Van Buskirk? Uh, sure, I'll start with, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to get your name wrong, sir, but I'll start with my question. I have one question for you, Mr. Van Buskirk, uh, and that's this. Um, there has been a rezoning application on this property before. Uh, the property to the south is zoned uh, RA7. Uh, the concerns that in general terms that the community has presented to the owner of this property, uh, the owner has tried to address. Uh, this zoning application is a direct control zoning. Uh, it uh, excludes any commercial development at, on the north part of the site. Uh, it limits the number of housing uh, dwelling units to a number substantially lower than, uh, than what is zoned for on the south site. Uh, it limits to some degree the types of, of buildings that can be structured. It does allow for four-story buildings, but uh, beyond that, uh, and it is screened from the rest of the neighborhood by virtue of the wooded lot. So understanding that there is a big traffic and road problem here anyway, I guess my question to you is this with that preamble. Um, this could pass today under those the conditions I just laid out for you, or it could be defeated. And if it's defeated, then some other application at some future date could come forward uh, frankly, with less restriction, uh, frankly, that would permit more uses and higher densities. Uh, what's your preference? 
Yes, that's quite the question, and uh, we've thought about that before in the community. Yep. We know that by adding the sites, there's going to be about, about 300 units for residential, and it creates about 1,800 vehicles per day, and the majority of those will be going right down White Law Drive. Uh, I don't know if there's any other way to route the traffic. At one time, I was thinking make Whispering River a one-way road going north, and that would cut half the traffic out of it anyway. I mean, there's other possibilities that have to be looked at, but uh, I know we're up against a rock and a hard place when it comes right down to it. Well, you've heard that, um, and I, I don't think this is where anybody wants to go, but that, you know, the missing piece of 16th Ave could be put to road, and that would that would be one potential solution set that's offered. That is, that is, I will pointedly say, not under consideration today. That, that's right. Also, yeah, when I when I moved into the area, 16th Avenue was there as a gravel road. That road was used to access the farm site that was on the AG1 lot now. And that 16th Avenue was a gravel road going from the farm site to 170th Street. 170th Street at the time was also a gravel road. And those roads both changed afterwards. 16th Avenue came out. So that's, uh, thank you for those comments. Um, any further thoughts about take this now or not and see what comes next? I, it's a tough I one. I, yeah. I know the, to, to develop both those sites, I think the, the plan is that one owner will have to, will end up with both of them. And then one owner will develop both those sites. And it probably won't be done in the immediate future, you know, one or two years. It might start on it, but uh, it will drag on for quite a while. Uh, that's negative side of it also. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for Mr. Van Buskirk? Not seeing any. Then, uh, Mr. Honstein, did you have any new information? <clears throat> uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I just wanted to maybe clarify a couple things that uh, were brought up during uh, during discussion uh, uh, with the uh, council members there in questioning. Uh, currently, you know, the proposed site is uh, is 1.6 kilometers away from the nearest shopping shopping area. It's uh, over 700 meters walk to the nearest transit uh, location, which cannot be changed. The roads are too narrow to accommodate any further transit into the uh, into the area. And uh, as far as developments go, uh, you know, with uh, just going back to the question to uh, Mr. Van Buskirk there, uh, you know, do we want to accept uh, what what is being proposed or? Or uh, you know have it defeated and have another uh, another application come forward later on. Uh, that there's currently an excess of units available in the area. We've I I don't know if uh, uh, the council members had a chance to see a map that I'd provided in a written submission uh, to uh, to this uh, project. But uh, all all the uh, all all the uh, medium density. Uh, developments are in the uh, Windermere Boulevard, Windermere Road area, and uh, and beyond. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have this facility be proposed for a medium density. The uh, the Elements uh, condo and apartment complex on Windermere Road, uh, right next to uh, Windermere Boulevard, is still yet to be built out. It's not completed. There's still uh, one more section to go in there. And from what I understand, their, uh, I think it was their fourth uh, stage is very, still very uh, empty. 
they're they're still uh, trying to sell out in that. So the the development here, as as Mr. Be uh, Van Buskirk uh, probably mentioned, would go on for years. And uh, and I'm thinking we're going to have construction traffic going down our road here for the next eight to ten years if that uh, if that gets put through. So just just a few comments. Uh, you know, open to any further questions. Thanks, uh, Mr. Carmel. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Did you have questions for Mr. Hunstein? Uh, no, thank you. His comments answered my question. Thank you, Mr. Hunstein. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Hunstein? Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, safety is paramount. And something that hasn't been discussed here is evacuation of the community. And as well, it was unfortunately, it was skipped over in my slides. Um, we have an unbelievable amount of large, heavy, muddy, noisy equipment, construction equipment, all day long, 12 hours, seven days a week. And it is so dangerous that that has to go in front of the schools. To have another 10 years of that is, it, 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 it's just absolutely gut-wrenching because if that runs somebody over, they're dead. They're, that, that's not even a, a, a comeback from it recover in the hospital that equipment will kill somebody so this is a problem that we need to fix but paramount we have one evacuation point and that is not being addressed here thank you thank you any questions for miss honstein if I could, Mr. Mayor, uh, just the one, uh, and I'll just repeat the same question, Ms. Honstein. Um, uh, I, I appreciate your concerns and your comments. However, is it better to take this, uh, I will say, somewhat restrictive application now or, uh, or not and, uh, and risk that something uh, that contains more units or more density or, or different development comes along? Your thoughts? I would think that if the city allows it to proceed, there are going to be so many financial and other consequences to the city of Edmonton that the city is going to spend a lot of money fixing and repairing this. Everything from taxes to upgrading the lake, doing mitigation things. Um, nobody is in a win here. And I'm. I, that's why I thought if it can become some type of parkland and there could be some type of benefit for the developers, then everybody is in a win. Right now, everybody is in a lose. And if it proceeds, we are gonna be all parties in a far worse lose because the developers will not be able to sell that land or develop it. It is a terrible piece of land that nobody will wanna live there anyhow. Thank, Thank you. you for your, your presentation today, Ms. Hunsky. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for administration? Any other new information? Not hearing any. Then would someone move closure of the public hearing? I'll move closure, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Second. Councillor Katarina. Seconded by Councillor Banga. Okay. Please vote on closure of the public hearing. Yes. Yes, Zavik. Yes, McKean. We're good to go, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. And that is carried unanimously to close the public hearing. I'll move uh, first reading of uh, 3, 11, 12, and 13, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, okay. Councillor Katarina, seconded by Councillor Banga. Is there anyone wishing to speak to it? Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I will not be able to support this, uh, this rezoning application today. Uh, I, quite frankly, I think it's worth seeing if there's uh, another solution that will present itself. Uh, I have had the opportunity to observe the various traffic uh, concerns uh, in action in front of the school at school entry time. 
Uh, I can tell you that this is such a concern for the schools that they're having uh, their parents that are involved in drop-off actually use the commercial strip uh, to the south and cross Windermere Boulevard because it's simply so dangerous, so congested, and so crowded in front of those schools. And I appreciate this is just for two periods during the day, um, but they are extremely dangerous, extremely problematic times. Uh, I am reasonably certain that the original design for this neighborhood was that one road would start northeast and turn north, and one road would start northeast and turn east, and they would cross in the middle and provide two more or less equal, more or less the same entry points into this neighborhood. And for whatever reason, one of those roads got snipped off and turned into a path. And now the neighborhood is suffering the consequences of that decision. Uh, this, this might get better with changes in signal operations and the addition of a, of an op, a signal at uh, Windermere Wind. But even that can't really be contemplated until there's improvements at the intersections on uh, Twilliger Drive. Uh, the traffic impacts are just are are enormous, and I just don't think that there's anything that can uh, that can overcome them. I do really appreciate the owner of this property has done his level best to try to find a solution that would meet with the approval and the support of the community. Uh, I will say that. Uh, you know, I, through my office, have asked administration to look into land swaps or other uses of this land. If you zoom out on Google Maps, you'll see that the other three corners of the Henday Twilliger interchange uh, have the development pushed way, way back from the interchange. So, you know, this is the only corner where there would be buildings in such proximity to that intersection. It, it really makes no sense at all in, in any context. Uh, so I think that we need to not go forward with this today to see if the transit, transportation and transit systems can evolve to uh, a better level of service for the community as it stands and we can begin to mitigate these very serious problems that the neighborhood is experiencing, uh, that we look for potential other solutions uh, for, these, uh, for this piece of land and ultimately for the land to the south of it, that we look to see if we can't find partnership solutions uh, in some way. That, uh, that serves everyone here. But proceeding with this today would be to turn a blind eye to the very serious concerns that, uh, that this neighborhood is uh, living with uh, and will simply uh, push a neighborhood that is already beyond the tipping point even farther away. So uh, I will leave it at that. I will not be able to support this application and I would encourage city council to vote no on this uh, and uh, help push for a different solution set for this property. Thank you. Thank you. Others wishing to speak? Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm feeling a little more torn than I expected when I was coming into this one. I, I was originally thinking I would support it uh, based off the fact that it's essentially switching uh, a land use from institutional to what is really, for all intents and purposes, what's going to be an R RA7. And so on paper, I, I could have seen why we would do that. And But I, I'm struggling with the design that we have here and, and the traffic impacts. And, and so in Councillor Cartmel's closing, I actually almost wish instead of the yes-no vote on this one, there'd be an option for referral back, even for a couple of months, just to re-examine the traffic conversation, because I think that is a very fair concern to raise. I think back to a application that we had in the West End maybe a year ago or so that we referred back, or actually that we actually defeated because there was no plan for proper transit connectivity to what was going to potentially be a six-story building. And, and so when I look at this and I see not great connection to transit with an existing issue, I, I'm almost wondering if, if there would be more value instead of just saying no than sending it back. So I'm, maybe I'm talking myself into putting forward a referral motion uh, but I, I, I'd almost prefer to see if that's a value to the to the ward councillor uh, instead of doing it myself. Um, and I see a couple of other heads sh shaking no. 
but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I would, I feel like that's a, this is a very legitimate issue that, you know, just because we, we've allowed it to be designed this way, I appreciate that this is an incremental impact in addition to whatever's there, but the impact that that's been presented seems to be quite substantial. So, um, that's that's where I'm struggling right now. So, again, well, Councillor, we're 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 debating whether to pass first reading. If if we were to um, uh, if if we were to refer, we would have to first reopen the public hearing and refer an open public hearing with instructions for things to happen, uh, and then the public yeah. hearing would have to continue. So. Um, absent, absent that motion, I'll ask you to confine your comments to the merits of whether we should adopt first reading or not. Fair enough. That's, that's a very fair point. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, then at this point, I think I'll, I'll just, and I think at the moment I'm leaning towards not supporting it, but would be interested in hearing some other perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Well, interesting enough, uh, I actually went back into our, into our, it's not easy to find. Um, in using our search engines and actually pulled up the original plan. And the original plan um, is pretty clear that that, uh, that that was not necessary to be open. Um, it shows up on the plan, but not as not as a collector. Um, you know, uh, and I think that's because it's a vestigial road. I think it existed already, um, which is which is why it's still there and why it was never closed. But it wasn't part of the thinking in the plan. The thinking in the plan, I think, was not was it not to be used. So um, I. The problem, I think, here is that this application is completely consistent with the plan that we have that was approved in 2006 and was before us. And I think it's a realistic expectation when we create these plans um, <coughs> that people in good faith move forward with their properties based on the fact that, that, the, that the plan is in place. I mean, we're often frustrated with people who move forward against the plan. This is one that's coming forward to us compliant with the plan. Um, and I, you know, and I, and I think that creates a certain kind of responsibility. I, I, you know, and we've, we've had these kind of issues before. I completely recognize that there's probably something in the transportation piece here that needs to get fixed. And it needs to get fixed whether or not this application goes forward or not. It's probably a separate piece of work and would probably demand some kind of um, uh, um, uh, 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 secondary motion to actually have a look at it. Um, because I think that's the real issue we've been debating here is whether or not the transportation plan for this neighborhood was done correctly or not in the first instance in 2006, not whether or not this is an appropriate use of this piece of land. Um, and that's the problem we should be fixing. And, and I think um, to, go against, to go against what was anticipated as the land use in this area, um, um, rather than debate whether or not we should be fixing the plan, I think is 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 a is an entirely different issue, and I and uh, I think for that reason I, I think it would be disingenuous to, to to these applicants not to support this because it's completely compliant with what their expectations would have been based on our planning when they bought this property. Um, which is not to say we shouldn't go back and fix what is clearly an issue in this neighborhood. Um, but that's a transportation issue that probably needs to be fixed using a different mechanism than, than saying no to this application. Because the irony is the, the other RA7, which will, you know, just to the south of this, which complete, create the same issues, wouldn't even come to council. Um, if it's completely compliant with the RA7 zoning, it'll be a class A and there will be no ability even for the development officer to say no. Um, so why we wouldn't apply the same rules to this property when the plan called for the same thing, I'm not sure. Um, so I do think I do think there's a probably a subsequent motion that's necessary, but I will be supporting it as it uh, as it's proposed here today for the land use piece. Um, and I think there's obviously a great need for 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 some kind of transportation study in here to fix what's a, clearly a long-standing issue that was created by the original plan. Thank you, uh, Councillor Banga. Councillor Banga. Hello. Yeah, finally got my button clicked in. Um, yeah, th today this application before us. Uh, I know the area residents have. Uh, uh, it, their main concern is traffic. 
Um, but what's before us today is, uh, again, uh, somebody else said it, uh, completely in compliance with. And uh, I also um, heard from all the discussions here today that if it is left the way it is, that it Thank you, Councillor Banga. Councillor Hamilton? Um, I'll be brief. Uh, I'm in agreement with Councillor Henderson. Um, and, you know, I, it cons I, I hear the applicant's concerns, and they are legitimate concerns, but they are not the applicant, the um, community's concerns, but they're neither the applicant's fault um, nor their problem. This is something that happened in the planning stage. Um, with the traffic and, and uh, how traffic was being managed through the community. And I think that we owe it, or I think we there's some onus on the city to uh, correct that issue and not, um, and, and it shouldn't be part, in my opinion, of the discussion around um, this particular application. Um, it currently, or it was planned for in, as institutional use. It's being moved to a DC one, which resembles an RA seven, of which there is uh, another similar site to the south. Um, we're often we're asked to choose the highest and best use of the land, and I would argue that they're probably that this is a very appropriate use of the land, save for the. Um, the manufactured issues within the community. So I, I have trouble not supporting this application. Um, I would, should it pass, I would hope that perhaps the counselor for the ward might bring a subsequent motion on addressing these issues because I, I don't see, uh, you know, I think that they the concerns of the community are merited and, and deserve to be um, addressed, but, perhaps not um, at the expense of uh, this particular uh, project. So I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Um, any further comments before we vote on first reading? Not seeing any, please vote. Yes. That was a verbal from Councillor Nichol, I, I believe. Okay. Uh, Councillor Cartmel, can we have your vote, please? Yeah, it's not coming up again, Devin. I'm a no. We're good to go. Thank you. Display the vote. That is carried 12 to 1. Mr. Mayor, I'll move second reading of 3, 11, 12, and 13. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Um, seconder for that, Councillor Banga. Second. Thank you. Okay, please vote on second reading. Yes. We need votes from Mr. Mayor and from Councillor Cartmel. No. We're good to go. Display the vote, please. Uh, that's carried. 12 to Mr. 1. Mayor, I'll move consideration for third reading on 3, 11, 12, and 13. Set. Thank you. For third reading to proceed, please vote. Yes. Yes. Uh, Councillor Paquette, can we have your vote, please? <clears throat> uh, I guess we'll have to trust the internet to let it through. But failing that, my vote is yes. We're good to go. Display the vote. Carried. And third reading, Councillor Katarina. 
Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, third reading on bylaws 19264, 19265, and 19266. Second. Thank you. Please vote on third and final reading. Yes. We're good to go. Display the vote. That is carried 12 to 1. Uh, Councillor Cartmel, if you have a subsequent, um, uh, that that uh, would certainly be in order. If you want some time to put it together, uh, we could come back to you before the end of the meeting. Yes, I would prefer that. I want to get the wording right, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, noted that that's your intent uh, for the benefit of, of those still on the line. Um, and listening, um, but uh, that dispenses with the hearing portion and bylaws related to Windermere, there, though there will be a subsequent later in the meeting on some of the issues we heard about. So um, <laughs> next then is the Belvedere item. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. This application is to amend the Belvedere Station Area Redevelopment Plan and the Fort Road Old Town Master Plan and to rezone portions of the station point to allow for low and medium rise apartments that are regulated through standard zones. Charter Bylaw 19262 would rezone areas B, D and E from the current DC1 to RA7 low rise apartment zone and area A to RA8 medium rise apartment zone. Bylaw 19251 would amend the Belvedere Stationary Redevelopment Plan to show medium to high density residential on the site instead of high density and update figures and outdated language. A resolution is also proposed to amend the Fort Road Old Town Master Plan to revise the text throughout from high density residential to medium to high density residential for the area of the proposed rezoning. The subject site, known as Station Point, is on a portion of land that is separated from the broader neighbourhood of Beverly by Fort Road, a six-lane separated arterial road and by the CN tracks that run along the southeast of the site. The Belvedere Transit and LRT station is located directly to the northeast. Station Point is divided into areas A through G. Areas A, B, D and E are part of this application and are currently vacant. Work on public lands within this area is complete and includes roadways, side, sidewalks, public plazas, servicing and a safety wall to provide a buffer from the CN tracks. Of the portion of Station Point on the southeast side of Fort Road, only Area C, which is not part of this application, has begun development. Construction by the, by the private developer has not been completed. Areas F and G have a mix of both vacant and operational commercial development. Fort Road has experienced a decline in recent decades resulting from business closures after two large meatpacking plants closed down in the 80s and 90s. Efforts to revitalize the area include the adoption of the Belvedere Stationary Redevelopment Plan in 1980, the adoption of the Fort Road Old Town Master Plan in 2002, and the Fort Road Urban Design Plan and Direct Control rezoning in 2007. The Belvedere Community Revitalization Levy was approved in 2012 and has funded the city's redevelopment of the Station Point area through purchasing of properties, completing environmental remediation, and installing new power, water, and drainage installation. By 2018, only Area C had begun development. The surrounding lands remained vacant with minimal interest in development. On January, of 20, January 23rd of 2018, City Council made a motion to explore the barriers to and opportunities for encouraging development at Station Point. Based on the feedback from prospective buyers and consultation with the Real Estate Advisory Committee, administration determined that the main barrier to development was that the current DC1 provisions are too ambitious in the type of development demanded and contained regulations that are too prescriptive. A third party market study was also completed to determine the most feasible type of development of the area. The study indicated the most suitable housing forms are stacked townhouses and small scale apartments which would allow flexibility in development phasing and lower price points. Further, the study concluded that the feasibility of office development is limited and that retail market space is highly oversupplied for demand that is generated in the catchment area and for future development. Through this analysis, administration determined that the most suitable zones for the vacant lands would be the RA7 
and the RAA zone. This application does not change the intent of a transit-oriented village. Rather, it scales down and it allows more flexibility. The current DC1 has regulations that are sufficiently detailed enough to be considered limiting. For example, it requires towers in each of the subject areas, prescribes the location of commercial and residential uses, and it requires residential parking to be in a structure either above or below ground. The development of this type of product is currently seen in the downtown and central area context where there are more amenities and services within walking distance. The proposed RA7 and 8 zones would provide a mix of medium scale residential while allowing opportunities for a smaller scale commercial uses where warranted. The image in this slide shows a general example of the difference in built form between the current and the proposed zoning. The Belvedere Stationary Redevelopment Plan applies to the site. The proposed zones for this area align with the intent of the ARP by encouraging the provision of additional family housing and the development of an urban village. The Fort Road Old Town Master Plan provides a concept for the redevelopment of the area, including the widening of Fort Road, the development of high-density residential development, new commercial development, improvement of the pedestrian orientation along Fort Road, and a network of pedestrian walkways. The concept is still possible under the proposed RA7 and RA8 zones, but with lower scale development. Fort Road has been widened and the station point lands have been subdivided, serviced and remediated. With this rezoning, the Fort Road urban design plan will have less weight in decision making, particularly with variances to the regulations proposed in the RA7 and RA8 zones. However, recently these zones have been rewritten with the main streets overlay. The sites will be governed by urban design regulation which encourages lively streets and active building edges. <coughs> the residential infill guidelines identify the proposed rezoning areas suitable for the proposed RA7 and 8 zones. Low-rise apartments are considered appropriate on corner sites and at the edge of a neighbourhood along an arterial road and along high-frequency transit corridors. Medium-rise apartments are considered appropriate in key activity centres, such adjacent to our LRT stations. The Transit Orient Development Guidelines identify the Belvedere Station as an employment centre. Only Area A and Area B fall within the 400 metre catchment area of these guidelines. The proposed RA7 and RA8 zones have minimum required density of 45 and 75 units per hectare respectively. Although lower than the guidelines suggest, they allow more flexibility, have no maximum densities and therefore could potentially result in the densities recommended by the guidelines. Over 8,000 pre-application notices were mailed out in May of 2019 and a public meeting was held with 31 people in attendance. After the application was submitted, another public meeting was held with 77 people in attendance. In general, there was consensus that the vacant land should be developed. Another frequently raised feedback included concern that the mix of developments and commercial uses will not be developed. Concerns were made about affordable housing being developed. There was a desire for large format commercial uses like grocery stores and comments that the rezoning has the potential to have positive impact on the area. In closing, administration supports the proposed rezoning as it encourages the redevelopment of a large and vacant land site. It proposes compatible zones and land uses, will provide flexibility while maintaining an appropriate density and positions the area to better leverage the significant city investment in public realm and infrastructure improvements in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now hear from um, speakers registered. Um, now we have in the order in which folks were registered, I think is okay. So we'll hear from uh, uh, Margot Auger, then Chris Janvier, then Loretta Belrose, and then uh, Claire St. Aubin. So uh, Margot, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thanks. Can I start? Yes, please go ahead. I can ask now, Kahkio. I acknowledge that we are unceded territory, and basically, what I've said is, uh, I just want to thank you all. Um, I acknowledge all of you for taking the time to meet with us today. Thank you, Mayor Evison, and the members of City Council, um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the rezoning of the Stony Point area. My name is Margot Auger. I am the Chief Administrative Officer for Treaty First Nations of Alberta. 
I'm delighted to be here to present on behalf of the Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta project team, and I would like to express our collective appreciation for the opportunity to make this presentation. Over the past several years, our Treaty 8 Fort Edmonton project team has been working with stakeholders to evolve an exciting development concept for these station point lands. Our presentation this afternoon will provide Council with an overview of this project. We're here to express our support for the proposed zoning changes. These changes will streamline approvals for the project and clarify municipal development and land use expectations. I want to start my presentation with some background on Treaty 8. On June 21st, 1899, two sovereigns entered into Treaty No. 8. The signatories of Treaty No. 8 represent the Nihio, the Nesselene, and the Satnai peoples in agreement to share with the lands in partnership. A number of promises and rights were to be guaranteed under this treaty. Our way of life was not to be interfered with and that our inherent rights would be retained. Treaty 8 is the largest treaty in Canada encompassing the land mass of approximately 840,000 kilometers, and it's home to 39 sovereign nations, including over half of Alberta, Saskatchewan, BC, Northwest Territories. Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta is the chief's political organization, and we serve 22 sovereign nations. Why are we here? So if you go to page three of the presentation, Treaty 8 Fort Road Project will realize significant benefits for Alberta First Nations and the surrounding communities. The initial project investment, construction, ongoing operations, maintenance and program delivery will have lasting positive impacts. City Council's support of the proposed rezoning paves the way for the Fort Edmonton project to be implemented. So if you go to page four, I saw a slide four. It talks a little bit, it shares a little bit about who the Fort Road project team are. Uh, in addition to this, uh, it's, it's comprised of the several Treaty 8 internal program experts and additional supporting external consultants. Together with individuals have positioned the Fort Road project for future success. I'd also like to mention that Eagle Builders is now also part of the project team. Eagle Builders has been selected through a design build competition to plan, design and build a Fort Road project. So a little bit about the project itself. So if you go to slide five, bit of the project interview, uh, sorry, overview. The Treaty of First Nations of Alberta, um, we've identified a number of opportunities to provide accommodations to First Nations and our nation members. So Treaty of First Nations of Alberta, we have approximately 58,000 members all over the place and over half of our members live off reserve. And so we serve everyone on and off reserve. And when we talk about serving everyone, we provide several uses uh, when it comes to delivery of our health program. So because our, our, na our nation's um, communities are isolated, we're not actually um, accessible or necessarily accessible or living in areas where we can bring our, our people uh, to a hospital setting, for example. And so a lot of our members are brought in here for any type of those specialized appointments um, and things like that. So the 24 Nations Lodge was a project that's been envisioned uh, and uh, it's been needed, very much needed by our elders, our nation communities. It's, it's, a, it's something that's been discussed for so many years and now finally we have so close to, have, to making this reality. The project programs will provide to band members supportive and tradi transitional accommodations, family and support services, medical liaison services. And so we talk about this, we transport our, our nation members from each of our communities and where, wherever they live. So. Um, basically. And when we talk about these specialized appointments, we have folks from all over the place that come in and they attend uh, things such as uh, treatment for cancer, for example. Um, in addition to this is the family reunification project. The family reunifi reunification project is another project that's so near and dear to Treaty 8. It's the uh, mechanism that was established our chiefs to, to bring our children home, our Treaty 8 children. So we talk about uh, our children and family services, that's, that's what we're talking about. And this re reunification project is that one step closer to bridge the families and the children that uh, we're trying to bring home to our communities, basically. So project goals, if you go to the next slide, is to provide accommodations for child and family support services. So right now, uh, and as well, I'm gonna mention support home style and community style living units while community members um, in the Edmonton region receive hospital medical care 
supporting their heal, healing journeys and recovery. So right now, we transport our members to various hotels in the city. And if you can imagine the food, um, the accommodations, um, very institutionalized. We talk about hotels, even though hotels can be very, very nice. And we've been investing into these hotels for so many years. And so our nations are saying we need to do something much more meaningful. It's also an opportunity to bring in employment, uh, to train our First Nation members. And that's one of the things that we spoke I'm about. Sorry. With the I'm sorry, Ms. Auger, I uh, really appreciate uh, the content of your presentation and its thoroughness. However, Unfortunately, the, the time limit is five minutes, so, uh, but there may be some questions for you. Uh, unless, is your intention to hand off the presentation to Mr. Janvier and Ms. Belrose? It is, yes. I was a little long-winded and got a little passionate about these projects, but I will definitely hand this off now to um, Chris Janvier, and he'll speak about the 24 Nation Lodge, and after that, you'll listen to Loretta, who'll speak about the reunification Well, just, just, before, just before you go, uh, strictly speaking, the way our, our process works is I have to check and see if there are any questions uh, for you at this time arising from the presentation. And then uh, if there are not, then uh, we can carry on and... Um, and loop back under new information if there are follow-up questions. So unfortunately, our, the process is set out by the Municipal Government Act is very linear, but uh, appreciate that you're stitching something together across several speakers here. So um, if there are no questions for you at this time, then perhaps uh, we'll move to Mr. Janvier uh, um, and um, hear the next five minutes of the presentation and then check in and see if there are any questions at that point, and then we'll proceed with uh, Ms. Belrose. So, uh, Mr. Janvier, welcome. Welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so I'll start off here. So good afternoon, Council. My name is Chris Janvier. I am the Health Policy Analyst for the Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta. And I'll just quickly touch on the proposed capital investment that uh, Margot uh, just, just about got to. So the total capital investment, Treaty 8, uh, has for the Family Reunification Centre and the 24 Nations Lodge is expected to be about $26 million. And currently we have invested approximately uh, $530,000 in the groundwork for the preparation and due diligence for the Fort Road project. Um, so I'll move on to my piece of the presentation now. So if you can move forward in the slides, please. Um, so I'd like to share a quick overview of the 24 Nations Lodge project. So through Treaty 8, we assist our members in accessing their non-insured health benefits. This includes transportation and accommodation when they're traveling to Edmonton for medical appointments and treatment. Typically, our members are housed in hotels for the duration of their stay. Uh, in most cases, our members are here for a few days, but for some, um, they may be here for weeks or months at a time, undergoing anything from cancer treatment for example, uh, to a mother and family dealing with a difficult pregnancy. And for many, this may be the longest they've been away from their home community, especially some of our elders. And in these instances, we don't believe a hotel is necessarily the best place for someone while uh, going through their treatment. The lack of social connection and connection to culture can often leave our members feeling isolated. And so what we hope to achieve uh, with the 24 Nations Lodge is to provide a home away from home atmosphere that will provide our members with culturally appropriate uh, support to aid in their healing journey. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, one more slide forward, thank you. So a little bit about the program. We hope to assist our members by providing the following, but not limited to uh, medical liaison services. So translation services for elders, for example, support booking appointments, or just uh, getting around the city, as well as shuttle services to and from appointments, and food service through a commercial kitchen to provide healthy, culturally appropriate meals. Next slide, please. And so a little bit about the community need. Unfortunately, we have heard from some of our members that they have experienced prejudice and racism when residing in mainstream hotel accommodation in the city. And so through the 24 Nations Lodge, we hope to address some of these issues by providing safe, secure and welcoming environment where our members can feel comfortable. And in the past year, Treaty 8 has seen over 3,500 distinct claimants visit Edmonton for medical treatment and appointments. And as you can imagine, the cost to our communities and our federal partners to provide these supports can be quite costly. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is not a new model. There are a number of these facilities operating throughout Canada and other provinces, specifically here in Edmonton, the Larga House, which offers similar services to Inuit and Northwest Territory residents, has been in operation for over 25 years. And they've also been assisting Treaty 8 in sharing their best practices and business model to set us up for success. Uh, and so my last slide here, uh, just a little bit about the building. This is a three-story lodge style accommodation. Uh, we're looking to have about 32 units, including wheelchair accessible, barrier-free units, uh, with a focus on space for our families, elders, and children. As well, we're looking to have underground parking to limit our on-street parking. And with that, that concludes my presentation. So thank you, Mayor and Council. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll just check in at this point to see questions from members of Council. Councilor Briquet, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to, to clarify with the presenters, uh, what we're talking about today is, uh, is a zoning change and not really about applications, but also thank you for coming in to share what your vision might be if this zoning is passed. Um, I guess my question for you is, um, so from what I'm gathering, this is sort of like um, Treaty 8's version of a Ronald McDonald house with expanded services like employment yes. uh, training, exactly. correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct, Councillor yeah. Piquet. Okay, and uh, so this is the type of thing that you, uh, you might be interested in building if this zoning progresses today. Yes, that is correct. We okay. have, you, uh, you have, have any other location. I'm assuming you have other locations in mind in case the zoning doesn't pass. Uh, yes, we do have uh, other locations we have been considering, uh, but Station Point is our primary location that we're looking at, and we have been uh, looking at it for quite some time now. Um, we really want to be invested in the community and um, I think that's where we envision this project, and this is where our chiefs envision us being as well. Okay. Now, to be blunt, uh, some residents are concerned about this potential rezoning um, because uh, they're concerned about people who um, may be homeless um, or suffering from addiction or any combination of these types of social ills. Um, expanded their numbers in the area when they hear that there may be um, a development put forward by an indigenous organization to serve uh, primarily indigenous people. Um, so how would you respond to that for the community? Yeah, so we, we do understand their concerns about the, the projects, but uh, our plan going forward with this is that we are planning to be a good neighbor we are hoping to be invested in the neighborhood and involve them every step of the way. Um, so there will also be opportunities for further engagement with the community on the site planning, uh, detailed design and operations, ongoing property management. But also we're, we're looking for opportunities to engage and partnership with the community um, to discuss, discuss future uses of their remnant land, for example, on the southeast corner of 66th Street and Fort Road. So this, there may be opportunities there for us to perhaps uh, establish a coffee shop, for example, or for some park space. Um, so I guess to summarize, yes, we, we really want to uh, work with the community to ensure that we're providing not only a safe community for the residents that live there, but also a safe community for our members that are coming to Edmonton for their medical treatment and, uh, and uh, assistance as well. Okay, so you represent, if the zoning were to pass, your project is the type of project that would provide uh, housing, provide a place for families, um, a place for employment training, and also commercial development. Yes, that's correct. Opportunity. Okay. Yes. And uh, if this zoning were to pass and something like your project came forward, then you would be talking with the community about potential community amenities with the community so that it would be something that uh, everyone felt that they had some ownership in, that they shared together. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Katarina. Uh, 
thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so a little confusion uh, here today with uh, this presentation because there is no uh, development plan uh, going forward. The, this is an administrative rezoning. Uh, so from uh, the finance uh, person, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, with, with the uh, with the numbers, uh, are uh, you uh, in negotiations with the city on the purchase of any of uh, of these lands? Uh, Councillor Caterina, it's Jesse uh, Inkpen from Law here, and I'd just like to remind you that any ancillary agreements that may or may not be occurring are not relevant to the land use planning discussion that we are having today. Um, okay. Um, so the it's city-owned property. Um, this is a, an administratively brought forward uh, rezoning uh, that uh, has been going on for many years now uh, with uh, uh, Peter Ohm. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to see this presentation a number of years ago from Treaty 8 uh, at, the, uh, at that time. Uh, so I'm, I'm confused here on uh, we're, we're discussing a project that doesn't exist. We're looking at a rezoning because of the difficulties that were uh, explained by administration on the DC being so prescriptive that we had uh, continual failure and the existing building that's on there now from BCM. Councillor, uh, Councillor. Um, I, I, Mr. Mayor, you, you've got to make a ruling on this, uh, whether we continue with the presentation on non-existent project uh, at this point in time, or we're dealing with a rezoning of, of this property because... So you're raising, uh, you're raising a point of order? Please, uh, Mr. Mayor, because I, you know, I've, I've seen the project a number of years ago, and uh, I think it's a great project, but that's not what we're here for today and how we end up with, with this project in front of us. Uh, that that's not uh, the course of business. Uh, uh, once a rezoning is done, anyone can come forward with their uh, proposals. Well, I, I, I understand your point because I agree with you that what's before us is the question of the zoning uh, for the whole area. Um, and um, however, we're also required to give pretty broad latitude to um, interested parties who who come forward, um, who may have an interest in in the lands, either from a development potential point of view or or from a um, uh, from an impacts point of view. Uh, so it's it's difficult for me to um, circumscribe as chair uh, what uh, applicants can bring forward. Your your point is well taken about immediate relevance to the. Um, uh, to the decision at hand, which is generally the zoning. Um, and, and a question that could be put to the applicants is, is from their point of view, as potential um, users of land in this area, uh, whether they believe the, uh, the zoning that's before us would, um, uh, would, would be helpful to their project or not. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, we, we we can't really get into the merits of an of their application or their proposal, um, though there's really no way I can prevent uh, any interested parties from from presenting um, at at the public hearing. So yeah, no, Mr. Mayor, uh, yeah, I, I didn't mean that as a slight on your uh, abilities here, and that I just I, I I hope that everybody understands both uh, for and against the centers now and the uh, uh, business association that. Uh, I don't know what they're going to respond to, but I imagine uh, it might be to this proposal and not to the actual rezoning that they were involved with for many years uh, in order to move station uh, uh, point lands ahead uh, with the rezoning uh, uh, and the changes from DC to R7, R8. Uh, so I, I guess I'll wait and hear from everyone. That That's fine. Uh, and uh, I'll hear from the association and... Uh, see what their perspective is on uh, whether it's the rezoning or whether it's this project. Which well, and uh, and and I'll, I ultimately uh, our 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 job is to hear everything uh, folks have to say and then assign relative weight and relevance to it. 
uh, to the decision that's properly before us. So we can also get some further advice from administration about what we should give way to and what we shouldn't once we've heard from uh, all of the speakers and again once we've had new information if that's if that's helpful to clarify. So so I, I understand what you're flagging certainly um, uh, but uh, I think um, it's the tension of a hearing being structured to um, uh, in favor of hearing all information and then it falling to us to, to judge uh, direct relevance to the decision, so. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, agreed, uh, no, that's fine. I'll, I'll uh, continue on listen to everybody and uh, hopefully it's uh, to the rezoning and to little else, but okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so next up would be, unless there are any other uh, questions still of Mr. Janvier. Uh, not seeing any, then uh, next up is Loretta Belrose. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I will be presenting on the Family Reunification Center. It's Loretta Belrose, the Executive Director of the Treaty 8 Urban Office. Uh, to provide a culturally adequate housing, provide long-term support for families within the program, six months to three years, provide 24 hours, seven days per week on-site with qualified staff, and to provide parenting skills development. To aid, family, to aid families with formal and informal resources, to develop life skills, including employment and education planning. If you follow me to page 16, the next slide, the, goals and, the goal and focus of the program, provide hands-on assistance to integrate children into the communities and schools. As I can see, there's a, a, a school across the road there called St. Francis. It provides a Cree Cree language training for the kids that would be a part of this facility. Provide a mentorship program to build self-esteem, confidence, and role models for children and youth. Provide a drug and alcohol-free environment. To provide childcare when parents are at scheduled appointments or in need of respite. To provide transportation as required. Next slide, page 17. Family reunification program, community need. Currently, 70% of all Indigenous, of all children in care are Indigenous, while they, while they only account for 10% of the total population. This has been a historic, historic concern regarding the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care. Many families have not had adequate resources to secure housing, delaying family reunification efforts. The Family Reunification Program provides wraparound services and life skill training for families within the program. Next slide, please. Current examples. An existing center in Edmonton was modeled after a program in Saskatoon called the Comfy Program. Program has been operating since 2004 and has achieved extremely positive outcomes and crime reduction in locations where their programs are located all over Canada, including Infinity House, Pritchard Home, Auntie's Place, and many more. Next slide, please. The center will be a four-story lodge-style housing for community members entering a family reunification program. 30 units will be available for culturally appropriate housing environments, provides wraparound services for families within the program, and will be an active member of the crime-free crime multi-housing program with the Edmonton Police Service. As you can see, that there's been an overdue um, availability of how we can address the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care. This program will support the community and we support fully the rezoning process. So my question to you today is, will you be our champion to change the history, the course of history for our children, not just in this community, for other communities in Alberta as well. But because of this program, there would, the, the whole issue of racism and discrimination that our peer pe people have experienced over the years, this will be a place where there'll be healthy families and it will be supported in the community when it comes to crime-free. 
So I'm hoping that would address the issue that uh, previous counselor um, brought to the table. It will have 24 hour secu security around, around the environment that we foresee as this project to take place. And it will bring down the crime in that area as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Belrose. Uh, questions? Um, maybe, Councillor Henderson, if you could take the chair. Yep, will do. Um, I really appreciate the invitation uh, uh, to, to be champions of the project, um, and I would be very happy to have uh, a meeting. It's been some time since I discussed this uh, proposal with Treaty 8, and, and so I would just suggest that um, in this hearing format, it's uh, challenging for Council to take a position on that because our job is to take a position on the general question of zoning. But uh, um, uh, I would very much like to offer to meet with you separate from this process uh, to discuss uh, uh, the project if, if you'd be willing to carry on the discussion uh, of the merits of the program and how what the city's position might be on on the project that you're proposing separate from this question of zoning for sure we would welcome the opportunity great and I'd be happy to uh, include members of council uh, certainly Councillor Paquette uh, as the ward councillor uh, in, in that um, so um, Thank you for that. Um, I guess my, my second question then directly to, to the heart of this is have you uh, uh, or your colleagues taken a look at uh, the zoning proposals that are before us and whether from your perspective uh, they um, uh, are aligned with what you're hoping uh, uh, you might build, generally speaking, in the area? Yes, sir, we have. And. And so that is, I presume then, just to connect all the dots, why you've registered in favor uh, uh, to speak uh, to the particular decision that's before us today with respect to the zoning. Yes, we fully support it. Great, okay. That's, that's helpful to establish uh, for, for our core purpose of today, and I look forward to a, a, a subsequent conversation um, uh, with you to get updated. Um, separate from this statutorily defined and 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 necessarily rigid um, process, so I'll uh, uh, take the chair back and um, Councillor McKean, you have questions? yeah, Mr. Mayor. Ahead. Thank you very much, and I <clears throat> just wanted to add my voice to what you said, and I would be uh, privileged to be in that meeting as someone who sits on City Council's Indigenous Initiative as well as our Housing Initiative. And I think the proposal sounds um, uh, amazing and would love to be in that meeting. But as you said, that's uh, not the focus of today per se in our cold colonial zoning uh, legal matter we have before us. So, but I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor McKean. Um, are there any other questions for Ms. Belrose? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, I understand that um, Miss uh, Saint Aubin, who uh, uh, who is um, registered on behalf of the city to answer questions as applicant, is is just to answer questions if there are any. But uh, it, from an uh, applicant standpoint, um, she's available from a regulatory standpoint, it would be city planning that would answer questions under administration. But if there are questions uh, for the, uh, the applicant, which happens to be the city wearing a different hat, uh, now would be the time. Mr. Mayor, it's Councillor Walter, so I, my thing shut down, so I didn't get on the list. Did you have questions for Ms. Belrose or for Ms. St. Aubin? Ms. St. Aubin. Okay. Uh, Councillor Paquette, you'd selected this. Do you have any questions for the? I'm just I've lost a, a speaker's list here, so. I do have uh, a couple questions, and I'm to be frank, I'm a little bit unclear about uh, the difference between the role that uh, Claire Saint Aubin is filling and the role that administration would fill. 
So, um, and someone can, Ms. Inkpen or others can correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, the city uh, is initiating the application here for the rezoning, not just from a sort of general zoning bylaw point of view, um, which sometimes administration does as tidy up, but very much here as an interested party with standing in the process uh, as owners of the land as well. So uh, the city, Miss St. Aubin is representing the city uh, from that perspective uh, as the applicant. Um, it, there is a bit of a church and state, uh, well, pardon me, that might not be the best metaphor, but there's, there is a, a, a paper wall at least between uh, the applicant's interests uh, as defined under uh, and their rights, frankly, um, uh, and so we have to set that aside um, uh, while we uh, hear from all all parties, and then also uh, city planners. Normally, we refer to city administration, but specifically, the planners have a role to um, administer the process in all of this and render their recommendation and do all of the technical reviews. So, Miss Saint Aubin is is submitting the material to be technically reviewed by Ms. Petron, Ms. McCabe, and, and um, uh, all of the other good folks who we normally hear from as administration. So, so city administration happens to be the applicant, but it's a different part of city administration wearing a different hat, and Ms. St. Aubin is representing that applicant function. So you, you may ask her the non-technical questions, the applicant uh, questions, and uh, you can uh, reserve the technical questions for uh, the administrative delegation in due course. Make sense? Yeah, I'm well with it. Did I, did I butcher that, Miss Inkpen, or is that satisfactory? No, you uh, accurately captured the process and the hats that everybody wore. Thank you, Mr. 13 Mayor. years in, finally. I think I understand. <laughs> Councilor Paquette, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. O'Ban. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for coming out. And uh, I guess my question would be, um, why now? Why are you making this application now? Well, this was prompted um, actually in 2018, we received a motion from council to explore the barriers and opportunities at Station Point um, for the zoning uh, specifically. Um, and we responded after uh, some analysis and consultation with uh, the development industry and potential buyers for the area, as well as the real estate advisory committee um, uh, we concluded that we thought the zoning was the primary barrier. So, really, so can you just sum up then, like, uh, just, you, you named a lot, but, I mean, it sounds like there was an extensive consultation uh, with various groups in order to come to this conclusion. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, you know, there are several components that have went into this analysis. So um, after doing our preliminary um, look around and uh, talking to the development industry, we went out and had a third party analysis conducted by Altus Group. Um, and we also take a look at our existing um, policy framework and the existing plans. We did uh, two public engagements uh, prior to our application uh, with the community um, we regularly meet with the Business Improvement Area um, Executive Director and Board. Um, so all of these things uh, factor into our decision. Okay. Or factor into our uh, application, our analysis. So really what we're looking at is an application to rezone land in order to spur development because that area has been stalled for over a decade. Um, and this was determined to be the best fit uh, or was there some, some other uh, zoning contemplated? That's right. Uh, the areas have been for sale since uh, 2012. We um, have heard from a lot of potential buyers over um, the years about the barriers for development. Um, you know, we're hearing that uh, the, the mixed use requirement, the tower requirement, um, is, and the parking in a structure above ground or below ground those are all things that would add to the cost of um, a dwelling unit in this area. So we took that and we had um, conversations and within our planning framework, we are still in the same vein 
that allows us to maintain the vision for this area as a vibrant place, um, as a place for families, um, as a place that has a village, as a place that supports the local commercial. Um, so, yes, this is the best zoning. Um, the, apparently, they couldn't make the numbers work. Uh, what about like selling the land? Was that a barrier? Like maybe our asking price was too high. Um, I just like um, to maybe, that, maybe that's something I shouldn't be asking. Okay, so let me put it this way. Um, so apparently, they couldn't make the barriers work or the numbers work. That was a barrier. Um, are we seeing? I mean, we had the presentation today, but with this rezoning. Do we see more interest with this potential rezoning, more interest in, in that than we saw in the previous zoning, the zoning we have right now? I think it's fair to say that. I mean, however far along Treaty 8 is in their proposal and their project, um, it's definitely um, an indication that we're headed in the right direction um, in, in terms of spring development in, in a timely way. Uh, you know, from a CRL perspective, that's also why we're here to continue to catalyze private development in the area. Um, we did actually have um, interest from Habitat for Humanity. Um, so we have, I mean, anecdotally, there has been a lot of interest uh, since we've started exploring the R7 and R8 zones. Okay. And last question, um, just in terms of demographics, you know, every community wants to be growing and thriving, and that means a lot of young families. And I'm just wondering how this impacts that kind of uh, dynamic, this potential zoning. Well, it would bring more families to the area, uh, certainly. And when you have more people, um, you have more vibrancy and it's uh, more dynamic. I think your public perception starts to change. Um, I think you have support for your local businesses. Um, so, you know, your catchment area for your local school, um, again, I think it, it really does start to achieve the goals um, that we see in the, the current planning framework. I am not sure why my dog chose right now. He's, she's had all day. It's quite all right. I'll rule favorably on the dog. Um, uh, Councillor Katarina, go ahead with questions. I'm glad my dog didn't see that, uh, or she'd be up on my lap right about now. So, uh, so Ms. O'Ban, thank you very much, and and, uh, uh, and not to prolong this, uh, but uh, uh, this has been going on uh, for some time. Station Point uh, was uh, designed or, or meant to be a TOD because of the Belvedere Station. Uh, at the time, we had contemplation of the. Uh, uh, Kathleen Andrews Garage and bringing employment to the area. Uh, it fits into the Baldwin Belvedere redevelopment plans. So this has been going on for years and years. And the first parcel that was sold, and if you can confirm this, uh, was pretty, uh, um, it, it was out there uh, uh, that uh, needed uh, changes. Uh, and it was a co op, uh, basically, idea uh, that needed changes year after year after year. And then BCM's project, uh, and you can confirm that as well too, please, if you can, uh, trying to meet the DC requirements that were set up uh, a number of years ago, uh, ran into trouble as well, and we know where they are at this point. So can you confirm the DC at the time uh, sounded like a great idea, but it had no, uh, got very little response, and the response that it did get uh, failed. I think that's, I mean, I don't have the history. I, I was around on the file when the um, uh, unfortunately, was. Yeah, unfortunately, I do have the history uh, since the CRL was implemented, mm -hmm. since the expropriation of all the lands, $95 million invested by the city uh, in the road construction, buying the lands, expropriating, mm -hmm. relocating, and on and on and on. So uh, Mr. Ohm and I had worked on this for a number of years. Uh, before he left uh, on what was needed. And that's what we uh, found was that the development industry uh, could not uh, make any projects work there under the restrictive DC uh, regulations. And uh, that was always the contemplation was to uh, 
change the zoning in order to accommodate exactly what we wanted, not necessarily in a tower scale, but in uh, a more, um, um, not as dense a version of, uh, of the village concept uh, uh, that we had planned for that area and to uh, help support the CRL that uh, the BIA uh, is supporting with their levies as well too. Uh, so. Um, that's this, right. I, I can confirm that that was the feedback we got from potential buyers on the site. Okay, and, and we've seen that in the last uh, uh, little while as well too. Uh, uh, the idea of the rezoning uh, and again uh, from the BIA, uh, my understanding is that they have been in support of a rezoning uh, in order to move things along and we've done other things in the area in conjunction with and unfortunately we you know uh councillor paquette we have a border at 66th street but that entire area uh was planned together uh as i said before with the kathleen andrews uh, uh redevelopment of that land and and on and on and on so uh i I, I hope that everybody understands that uh, this has been many years in the works to get to this point uh, that we think we have the best uh, chance of advancing uh, that TOD uh, in the city. Ms. St. Uh, that that's the idea behind the rezoning. That is the idea behind the rezoning, you know, um, from a CRL perspective, as I mentioned, uh, we are completely committed still working very hard at uh, trying to encourage development in this area and it's development that aligns with the CRL area levy plan um, that aligns with the current planning framework that we have which is primarily residential as a use this zoning um, allows for flexibility in the commercial and I think um, you know again with treaty 8 here and our uh, prior interest from um, habitat if those are any indication, um, we're on the right track. With the BIA and from what we heard from uh, other community members, they do want to see development there. Um, you know, we're diverging uh, a bit where the BIA would prefer to see more business based, um, but we'd like to leave that uh, flexible. That's what we've heard will work. Yeah, and there's still the opportunity for uh, for that, and hopefully the uh, existing building uh, will be resolved at some point, and the retail is uh, is there to help the uh, BIA uh, along in contributions to it. So uh, I'm out of time, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, long, long in the process uh, at this point. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Councillor Walters. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, uh, and thank you, uh, Ms. Senoban, for. Uh, in here for questions. I just wanted you to provide any more insight. You kind of were getting at this in response to Councillor Paquette, but around the, any market analysis that you've done uh, that led to this, you know, other than the fact that nothing much is, you know, not a lot has happened or not as much has happened as we would have liked. Uh, but talk about the market analysis and how this different mix of residential uh, will will work better here. Okay, so um, we asked Altus Group to complete a study uh, to determine the best product, the most saleable product, um, and the most feasible development for the area. Um, what they determined was that we should plan for lower densities, uh, take a phased approach, so sort of take down our expectations in terms of um, how many units can come on for uh, each year, and uh, relax our requirements around parking in a structure, either above or below ground, um, relax our urban design requirements. Um, and they, I mean, there's a lot of other factors that went into the um, Altus group report, um, including they did look at uh, commercial uh, office feasibility um, from a citywide perspective and a local perspective. They also looked at retail feasibility um, and they still concluded uh, the best thing was primarily residential low and just switching to a lower density. Okay, okay. thank you for that. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Zadig? Thank you very much. Uh, to the city as applicant, when we haven't had 
the, the level of interest that we've expected on the DC1 properties in the past. Have any discussions occurred with potential buyers about them acquiring the property as DC1 and then them rezoning on their own? And any level of indication of support from the city for such an application? So, Councillor Zadek, this is Jesse Inkpen from Law once again. Um, I just want to caution you about talking about the sale of this property or transfer of ownership of the property, knowing that, of course, the decision before you today is the land use decision and the zoning specifically. Yeah, exactly. I'm talking about rezoning and I'm talking about it's the history of this site. Um, have, have parties come before the city and then they try and make the DC one work and then they realize that it wouldn't work and then have they talked about them rezoning it on their own? No. No, so that, that conversation has never occurred. Okay. And I'm wondering why are we looking at rezoning all of it now? There's many parcels. If, they're, if we were taking a phased approach, it seems to me that perhaps we could uh, experiment with this uh, hypothesis that the market will respond better to traditional zoning, uh, it, it occurs to me that perhaps the city may want to just rezone a portion of the land to a traditional zone and then and then uh, see the level of interest in that. And I guess maybe that question is getting a bit beyond land use, but so I'll rephrase it because that's about speculation, but to rephrase it, why all of it right now versus just a portion of it when it's multiple parcels? Uh, we did talk about uh, phasing one at a time or as uh, development interest expressed itself. Um, it's just with the uh, conclusions of the market analysis and um, in our own analysis um, and talking and having public engagement, uh, we know that the DC1 isn't working. So, and we've been given a very clear recommendation uh, that planning for lower densities and taking a phased approach is the way to go. So one rezoning application for the site is the direction we've decided to take. Was there any consideration to uh, a site, a standard zone that's uh, specific to the neighborhood? And uh, to that, what I mean is sort of what we do in, in Griesbach or Windermere or pretty much any new larger greenfield development where there's a, a neighborhood specific, not an overlay, but just a, based off of an RE7 or an RE8 with a, a little bit extra is how I phrase it. Uh, so like an RE7 extra. plus the Belvedere consideration. Councilor Zadig, we have um, quite a bit of planning um, documents, statutory plans and non-statutory plans uh, for the area. Um, so, you know, my rezoning colleagues can speak to this probably a little bit better than me, but I think we consider the current pl planning framework we have, and as you saw in the presentation, um, as sufficient uh, to give us a desired product and the desired outcome. In the other examples I used uh, for other neighborhoods, they also have other planning work in place. But so, yeah, if someone could just weigh in on that. Because, because what I want to see here is I want to see something happen. Um, but I don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater, and I, th I think we could do a bit better than just a standard zone, in part just to live up to the vision of the area and the significant municipal investment that's already occurred there. So if someone can just weigh in on, on that. That's it. The standard zone is the best approach. It is allows for the most flexibility with development interest. Okay, well, it's definitely the most flexible. Okay, no more questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. I understand there's a, there was a motion in 2018 to uh, identify the barriers and opportunities to spur some development in this area. Normally, when an application for zoning comes before us, it's initiated by a developer. The developer does all the legwork uh, and the initial, I guess, uh, expenses that come along with the, uh, the, all the studies. In, in this case, the city undertook that. 
could somebody tell me uh, why, <coughs> why it, does that usually happen? Does the city usually do that unless they need it on use? It does happen. Um, and we have an interest um, in this land uh, from two uh, perspectives. One is we own the land um, and the other is we have a CRL. Uh, so we're motivated um, and um, I mean, community interest at heart as well. Uh, we tried the DC1 zoning. Um, it isn't working to spur development and now we're uh, changing course. Okay, well, uh, not to presume the outcome of this public hearing, let's say if it goes through, what are the next steps? Uh, well, the next steps will to be to see what development interest this drums up. Okay, but uh, the th three speakers uh, that spoke in favor that part has nothing to do with application today. Councillor Ranga, it's Jesse from Law, um, just sort of stepping in and just letting you know that the three speakers who have presented today present what could be a potential use on this property if the zoning was approved. Um, keeping in mind, Councillor Ranga, that the zoning that's before you today is a full suite of uses. Um, and so it's not just necessarily that one particular development, but rather a whole suite of potential developments in perpetuity on this land. So just, I just ask that you keep that in mind respectfully. Thank you. Thank you, no more questions. Thank you, are there any further questions for Ms. St. Aubin? Not seeing any, then we will now turn to speakers registered uh, in opposition, uh, Mr. Uh, Grimble is up first. Hello, are you uh, waiting for me? Yes, go ahead, sir. I didn't hear. You just said, sir. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm here as one of two speakers representing the Fort Road Business Improvement Area. Uh, the Fort Road BIA has a vital interest in this future of Station Point lands for many reasons, and we hope Council will give some consideration to them. The BIA is opposed to the present rezoning of Station Point lands. While the current proposal is not acceptable, the BIA does not support the status quo either. We believe that both the Belvedere Station ARP and the Station Point lands zoning should be changed. However, we do not believe the application presented by the administration is the right approach. We believe that the right approach is to restore Fort Road to its former role as a commercial area by rezoning station lands for commercial uses, such as those set out on the commercial office zone of the zoning bylaw. Our approach is also supported by the Belvedere community. Our position is based on two conclusions. First, Station Point lands are not suitable for residential use, period. This is not only our conclusion, but is also the observation of the Altus, Altus Group, who has been referred to by a previous speaker. Their observation is as follows. In summary, the location of the subject lands as a residential destination can be concluded to be quite challenging. While it benefits from significant employment modes close by and from easy access to the LRT, it is negatively impacted by adjacent railway lines and industrial areas, dilapidated street front retail across Fort Road, undesirable sidewalks and streetscapes, the nature of much of the commercial uses along Fort Road and by limited pedestrian activity. The reality is the city has been promoting residential development in this area since the adoption of the Belvedere Station ARP 40 years ago. It has not worked. The Station Point lands were adopted in 2007. While this plan was aspirational, and, and I give everybody credit for 
looking at an ideal situation, it also failed. The residential model, which forms the basis of the station, Point Lands and Belvedere Station ARP has failed and it's time to change course. It's time for a new approach. Secondly, from the point of view of the Fort Road business community, it needs an opportunity to establish a new economic base. This area flourished during the 20th century while the meatpacking industry was available, but the meatpacking industry moved out. The Northeast as a whole economic unit has not found a new economic base. Relative to the city of Edmonton, the Northeast has the smallest inventory of both commercial and industrial development. The Fort Rose business improvement area has vibrant businesses uh, north of 129th Avenue. Uh, while some successful development has occurred to the south of 129th Avenue, a new approach is needed to this area to attract new investment and the station point is part of that. This land is serviced, it is undeveloped, and the lots are large enough to accommodate a variety of commercial uses. So what are the options? Fort Road cannot be developed in the same way as other BIAs. The Altus Group correctly identified the limitations facing traditional development for Fort Road, and I quote, the character of Fort Road as an urban arterial also negatively impacts the potential for street fronting retail at this site. This retail format typically requires substantial pedestrian traffic, slow moving vehicles with on-street parking and or on-site high, high on-site residential or, or office densities, none of which are currently apply to the subject site. The LRT has an advantage for destination commercial uses, such as offices, simply because it provides efficient access to other nodes in the city, such as downtown, Nate, University of Alberta, and both city hospitals. So what are the challenges? COVID-19, it was gonna accelerate many changes in how we live and work. Obviously commercial office needs will change, but nobody knows how. And if you find the guy who has the magic bullet, let me know. The new normal is going to require accessibility, flexibility, affordability, and innovation. Station Point meets all those criteria. It's time for a new approach to Fort Road and Station Point. The proposed rezoning for residential development is just continuation of a failed approach, which will not benefit the Fort Road community. Time for a change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Grimble. Questions? Councillor Paquette. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Grimble, for your presentation. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can respond uh, a little, with a little bit more uh, clarity, maybe expand on uh, the issue that the Altus Group study um, presented that there was a an overabundance of commercial in the area and uh, with BCM now back in business of being uh, constructed that when those doors open that's an entire uh, row of extra commercial so I'm just I, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on that um, I don't sure whether you have seen the entire uh, document the Aldous group produced but I encourage you to look at page 60 and you look at uh, figure 55, which basically okay. outlines the uh, commercial office space in Edmonton. And if you look at that map, you will see that there is nothing in Northeast Edmonton. There's my argument. I mean, they, I agree that on a citywide basis and a suburban basis, there's no question that the inventory of commercial space is exceeding the demand. But, you know, um, 10 years ago, it did not. And okay. what we're looking at here, hopefully, is a future for the economic activity in Northeast Edmonton. We aren't going to get, if we keep building houses, where we can build businesses. End of story. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm also thinking about timelines. 
Um, you referenced COVID-19 and sort of this economic uh, situation we find ourselves in and the overabundance now that we'll be looking at with commercial space uh, in Edmonton. I'm just wondering what you see as the potential timeline for that type of development if, uh, if there was that kind of zoning in Station Point, what the timeline would be to get that type of de development in the area and... Um, Oh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, that's, I, I, I really, I don't think anybody can really provide that kind of certainty. Um, okay. What I, what I do, what I, my premise of my argument is, is simply that if we are going to have struggles for commercial space, the properties which are going to struggle are not the ones which are close in to where the demand lies. And we're accessibility line. I mean, you can go way up in the north part of Sherwood Park and find lots of office space there. But they're not convenient to any of the new centers that are, are the, new, the new base for economic activity in Edmonton, which is a knowledge-based industry. They're close to the refinery row and all the rest of that. But, but you know, this, this LRT is a tremendous asset for doing that. What about the downtown towers? Those are the ones that might be at risk because how do you move people up and down ele elevators with social distancing? But if you have ground level access, guess what? You can make a pretty good argument there to accommodate somebody's needs. Okay, yeah. So, uh, in in your in your work so far, have you have you been approached by uh, commercial developers who want to develop? Uh, you know, high-rise or, or large-scale commercial business uh, developments in that area, but uh, they just don't want to go through the uh, reapplication of the zone? Well, there's two problems. Um, number one is is that, that we, we have no credibility that actually they can get a zoning application for commercial. So it's a little bit, uh, we're not in a position to negotiate with specific people. We don't own the property, but we're just promoters. However, we are, we have been engaged in a process for now of about a year, year and a half to develop a marketing program to do just that. The problem is until we have a firm foundation of what we're trying to market, we're going to have a difficulty developing our marketing plan. And we have the money to do it. We've got a, you know, 40,000 bucks left to do it. And um, that's what we're trying to do. So that's exactly okay. what we're we had, if, if we could provide some certainty or some, but not even certainty, but basically a direction that commercial development is going to be the priority, we will try and market it. I, I can't guarantee any successes, but we certainly have the resources to do that. All right. Okay. Um, looks like I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Grimble. Really appreciate it. Any other questions for Mr. Grimble? Not seeing any. I think we've got uh, uh, a bit more time to spend on this. The question back to council, and I'm seeing a um, preliminary indication as folks would like to take the scheduled dinner break and then carry on at 7 p.m. Uh, that would not be my preference, but uh, it is, of course, the will of council. So. Uh, Uh, well, yeah, I, I'm no longer um, uh, good at estimating how long any of this will ever take. So, um, absent a motion to change orders, Mr. Merrick, can I can I I be prepared to move that we um, move the dinner break half an hour back, and then we can reevaluate at that time. Second. Okay. You know, because I think I think you know our practice of keeping on going and suddenly realize we're at nine o'clock and we should have taken a break is not a good one either. Agreed. But if we time limit this, then we'll have a better feel of where we're at at that point. Okay. Uh, at that point, we could then take a one-hour break, uh, um, or or the full hour and a half, or press forward if it's if it's almost done. So uh, so that motion is before us to extend for half an hour. Um, Second. Uh, Okay, I think it was seconded earlier by, I didn't catch a councillor, I did hear it seconded earlier. Uh, councillor Walters. Walters had seconded it earlier, so um, is there any debate on that, or uh, can I call the vote? 
And not hearing any debate, then I will call a vote on continuing for one hour, or pardon me, for yes. half an hour. <clears throat> I'm a yes. Thank you. We're good to go. Thank you. Uh, display the vote. That's carried 12 to 1. All right. Um, let's carry on then. There were no further questions for Mr. Grimble, so let's hear now from Mr. Leong. <clears throat> Hello to all. Honorable Donna Iveson and council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Han Leong. I'm a developer in this beautiful city of ours and I represent the Four Road BIA and community of Belvedere. The city has been reaching out to many developers and social agencies, yet I am possibly the only developer left standing that has succeeded in the area and I have never received any requests for feedback. The BIA has also has decades of experience in the area, and yet we are not included in the planning of the rezoning. It's also confusing to begin a discussion about rezoning with a sales presentation from Treaty 8. It feels like we're either getting ahead of ourselves or that there are serious planning conversations going on between Treaty 8 and city officials that the general public and BIA are not privy to, which is discouraging. As my colleague Don Grimble had illustrated, the city contracted Altus Group to provide an opinion on the feasibility of Station Point. Their conclusion was that the Station Point lands are not suitable for residential use. The marketplace has spoken and proximity to LRT cannot overcome all other obstacles for residential development. Community League of Belvedere has also provided letters of support for the use of State Point as a commercial office. The area once thrived because the meatpacking industry provided jobs and means of living. People working in the plants would live nearby and visit the neighboring businesses. BIA feels strongly that job creation in the area will stimulate this corner of the city. Fort Road needs a new economic base, be it a public utility or service, or simple as a library and grocery store. The site is large enough to accommodate large office buildings and commercial uses and the LRT can provide access to regular workers and unique visitors for public services alike. In fact, the zoning for commercial office almost seems written for this area. And I quote, commercial office is defined as being, quote, medium intensity traffic, commercial and residential developments around LRT or locations of good access by both private auto and transit. This is exactly what the BIA and Community League are proposing. Not only does the Northeast have the smallest inventory of office space in Edmonton, it also has high accessibility, both by vehicle and public transit. Also, the four service lots are large enough and can accommodate on-site parking and a multitude of uses. The new Kathleen Andrews bus garage is a great example of job stimulating the area. The 400 essential workers that have relocated to this garage have been purchasing goods from nearby stores, sending their kids to daycares, buying them food for lunch. We should replicate these successes, not duplicate past failures. Rezoning station port from DC1 to RE7 is the single greatest concern for the BIA because it could allow multi-unit housing without public consultation. By going to RE7, we are duplicating past failure by continuing to try to change this area into a residential hub instead of a business hub. I remind the council that our BIA was gutted when land was expropriated and businesses evicted for station point mixed use, not for RA7 low density residential developments that could become a refuge for low income housing. Personally, I feel the city is trying to kill two birds with one stone by rezoning to RA7. Undoubtedly, it will help not-for-profits enter undeterred to meet their affordable housing mandates and for the city to recoup some CRL tax revenue on the TOD experiment. In 2019, the committee gathered to voice opposition to Homer Trust's vision for affordable and supportive housing station point. Because community consultation was required, we were allowed to sit at the table and voice our concerns while plans were being discussed. Ultimately, because of our efforts, the development stalled and did not continue. What we realized was that the timing is paramount. Putting low-income housing in this area first will only encourage more low-income housing in the area and turn away private investment dollars. The communities of Ball and Belvedere vehemently disapprove of any zoning changes that will allow additional affordable and supportive housing be developed without community consultation and notification. The commercial office zoning satisfies our need for businesses in the area and makes multi-unit housing at least a discretionary use, which would at least require community notifications. Without being in those meetings where these topics are being discussed, the only thing the city is stimulating is public distrust. 
Honorable Don Iveson and council members, the businesses and residents of Fort Road and Belvedere want their businesses back. They want larger commercial amenities and large format stores to fill the hole left where we lost our local economic base due to expropriation. It is time to make things right by bringing the businesses back. However, this rezoning indicates to the BIA and the community that our voices are not being heard under the current or proposed zoning. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, questions for Mr. Zong? Councillor Paquette? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a quick, uh, couple quick ones. Okay, so thank you for your presentation. I can understand how the lack of movement in this area can be frustrating. It is definitely frustrating for everyone. Um, so I guess my question would be, in, in light of uh, the economic situation um, and in light of uh, people moving more toward, as we are right now, remote ways of doing business, I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts are on the actual uh, market demand for more commercial space and business office space. <clears throat> uh, right now. I'm trying to figure this out because uh, it's been 10 years plus in Station Point without movement. And uh, I'm just, you know, how many more years or decades do we go before we say maybe there's not interest in this area? Thank you, Councillor Paquette. I, I won't comment on things that, um, you know, regarding COVID. I don't think anybody can comment on where they think the city or businesses are heading regarding COVID. What I do understand is that this decision is a decision that could be lasting for greater than 20 years and COVID will not last 20 years. So I guess my answer to you is that I, I wouldn't base my decision based on today's um, environment. Um, I'm forward looking, I'm a developer. So I, I always base my decisions on what's going to happen over the next 20 years. So, um, so to that point, I, I don't really have an answer for you. Sorry. Oh, no, fair enough. Um, and then I'm, uh, my other question is, uh, so you mentioned low income housing. I don't think that that was the, the goal here, but um, it's definitely a concern that the community has because of the, uh, their experience with Homer Trust and the fact that there was a, a senior's uh, place that was to be built and then it turned into something else. And uh, so there's definitely some concern among the community that this is just going to be something to put more um, you know, affordable or supportive, permanent supportive housing into. That's sort of what you're saying, is that right? Yeah, I think, I think with zoning, you, they need to be prescriptive. They, you need to be able to rely on them in order to plan as a developer. And I think uh, a lot of the, what's going on with the low income housing or a lot of these affordable housings is that the barriers of entry become much le less uh, on an RE7 versus a DC1 which is also, yes, uh, a question on HTTP because that's why developers don't want to get involved with DC1. Um, what I'm worried about is that uh, because of the, the way, the, the location where it's situated not being quite pleasant, where there's railroads, there's uh, brownfields and, and LRT, which can bring um, transient people in and out very easily. It's hard for me to think that, you know, a well-to-do family or even a, a starter family would want to, you know, purchase something or townhome in that area. They would look to other areas. So, so sooner or later, you will just find people that are willing to rent in these areas. And most people are typically, you know, hard to house people. And um, that's just the economics of, 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 of housing. So, um, yeah, I do think that this will spur a lot of low income housing in the area. It's not, what the BIA is looking for, definitely not what the neighboring communities want. Um, I'm sure that uh, as they found out more about this this proposal, uh, there will be a lot of backlash, and uh, we are pre preparing countermeasures um, to to make our voices heard. Right. So that's what I'm curious about. I, so is the goal then to um, I mean, the goal was obviously to turn this into a major commercial concern. We didn't get the interest. We've been waiting for over a decade. In the meantime, population in the area has been getting older and it's not being replaced by young families. And so uh, people frequenting the stores and the shops and the restaurants and things like that are declining. Um, so 
I, I'm just sort of trying to weigh my mind when it comes to zoning. Is it better to have more young families in who will frequent businesses and spend their money and uh, have guests who will also spend money in the area? Um, or is it better to hold off on that and spend the next few years trying to court uh, commercial and business office space and, and that sort of thing um, on a road that is primarily right now commercial. Do you understand like where yeah, the challenge? I think yeah. the original planning was that I think if anyone had their businesses expropriated at the time, they were hoping that businesses would be placed at least at the ground level and that the higher densities of the high rise apartments would be the bonus, which is why we wanted to do the TOD. Um, I think now we've completely went away from that conversation now, and we're not even considering the businesses that have been lost. And we're just trying to plug something in there to receive tax dollars. And that's great, but it will only result in future problems, you know, with social disorder and people leaving the area. You bring in new people, you leave older people out, you know, they, they will not come back. And so I feel like it's quite unfair for the existing um, people that live in those neighborhoods to basically adjust um, to allow new visitors into the area. I think it would be more exemplary to, to bring just unique people there for businesses, to have people take the train from the south side to see a, a doctor or something that they really like. Uh, I think there's we need to bring traffic into the area, and typically that means higher density, but it doesn't need to be just um, apartment buildings. It can be uh, commercial buildings and, and retail and things like that and social services. So... Um, um. I guess that's kind of where I uh, where I, I feel. Thank you, uh, Councillor Katarina. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, nice to see you, Don and uh, Han. Han, to you, uh, you mentioned that you weren't uh, or the association uh, wasn't part of uh, the process for the rezoning. No discussions uh, in the last two, three, four years. Um, I no, I, for I, I that, that, that the, the association has been involved in discussions uh, because of uh, Caritas and because of BCM. So please clarify that for me because uh, I was under the impression and, and I was at some of the meetings so uh, that we had discussed this. Yeah, you know, we, we have provided feedback. What I was uh, uh, mentioning was just more recent planning for the rezoning uh, from a DC-1 to RE-7 is when we were kind of left in the cold. Uh, we were able to provide a presentation, uh, a written presentation uh, that we submitted uh, that reflected our opinion on the area. And um, outside of our executive director, Deanna Fullendorf, speaking to uh, the city officials and administration, we did not um, have any feedback from that. We just... We just sent it, and we never heard back uh, relating to our concerns. Okay, I can't. Uh, I can't speak to that. Um, sort of conflicting uh, uh, for me at this point, anyway. Uh, uh, the, the idea of TOD residential mixed use and so forth. There's there's a question I need to ask you. Um, when the Canadian Tire site uh, became vacant, uh, with a great opportunity for commercial development. Uh, Han, you know, as well as I do, it became an overflow parking lot for Londonderry Chrysler. Worst thing you could have in a BIA, yet I heard nothing from the membership about that land being used for overflow parking for a car lot, which it's, it's there, historic, but shouldn't be on any of our city streets. Uh, they should be in out uh, in the outskirts. Right. I, I don't know too much about Canadian Tire outside of the fact that they are privately owned. Um, that lot is belongs to them and they can choose um, to do what they want. I mean, we can all... My understanding is that it was sold. Correct. To London Dairy Chrysler. So uh, that's not my question. My question is the BIA, uh, knowing that uh, you had an opportunity there for uh, a huge site, probably almost as big as this one, uh, to go out and promote, or uh, yet I heard nothing uh, from the right. association that they were concerned about uh, uh, basically another car lot, which, which brings no value to the area. 
I, I agree. The car lot that definitely does not provide much value, but I, I think I'll just speak from a property developer is that, um, you know, the market in the area uh, would require a substantial investment. Most people that are going to purchase that lot are going to buy it as is, and they're going to use the lot for what it provides. They're not going to invest. You know, I think it makes perfect sense for a Chrysler to want to get there and, and operate that site because of the lot. Um, but if you look into other uses, possibly a storage center, I mean, these are not things that um, I don't, I mean, they're good businesses, of course, but uh, they're not the things that I think are going to bring the high density. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, of course the Chrysler purchasing that lot was, was not a good thing, but uh, as a BIA, what can we do to stop them other than protest and, and speak to them? I mean, I'm not going to argue the point of stopping them or not stopping them. Uh, uh, here, the idea is, I mean, we wanted residential use in order to support the businesses uh, there. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a little bit confused here. Uh, if, in a BIA, if I was in a BIA, I'd want residents there to support my business. Uh, if I have a commercial office building uh, that they arrive and leave at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that doesn't help me as a, as a BIA. I, that's my thinking. Uh, that I would want people there uh, 24 hours a day that could use my services, like your daycare center, like the medical facility uh, there, so forth and so on. So I'm confused on the approach that the BIA is taking on moving a parcel of land that has no success and no possibility of success under DC-1 and at least looking at it from perspective that you will have residences there along with Kathleen Andrews uh, Employment Center and on and on and on. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm confused on, on this because I've heard differently from the association before. I think it, it goes to the use of the land. If you rezone to RE7, the possibility, um, so it's about density, about how many people are there. Um, how many people, there will not be a lot of people there if they're all townhomes. I mean, if it'd be different if you had a high rise where there's 20 levels and there's four units on each level. But what's going to happen, what I expect is that you're going to see a lot of townhomes and, and very normal um, low income housing developments there. And that the density is not even going to make a difference um, in terms of helping the businesses in the area. I think, I think uh, you know, basically that would be the point. But I understand. I I think at this point it would be about bringing a lot of people in from all parts of Edmonton to visit this area as as being a way to mitigate this loss of density. Mr. Mayor, I'm out of time, uh, unfortunately, so uh, I won't need a second round. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Long? Not seeing any. Thank you for your submission. We'll turn now to questions of the city planners. Um, Councilor Paquette, start us off. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, we, we heard a lot here. And uh, so, you know, you heard a lot of uh, uh, comments and opinions on what the motivation for the city would be, that uh, this is not a good place for uh, residential access to LRT zones. So, from the things that you've heard, I'm just wondering if you would care to respond. Councillor Paquette, we, we have heard that, but we've also heard, and um, I think as Miss, Miss O'Ban has uh, stated very, very well, this, is, this area does come with its difficulties, and um, the uses that are being proposed today, we see them as being quite fitting and uh, uses that will um, maybe spur on some development in this area and maybe maybe have a positive effect. If the fact that if it remains vacant, uh, we're not sure what other uses will come in in the future. Okay. And uh, so what we're hearing is this concern that um, the city is opening this up and it will just become sort of this... Uh, uh, dumping ground for people who, who maybe folks don't want in their neighborhood. Um, you know, that's that's the fear that's being sort of uh, articulated here. And um, is that something that that you think is uh, the intent? 
I, I'm just going to jump in here. Sorry, Councillor Briquette. This is Jesse from Law. I just want to remind you that uh, when we do our zoning, we zone yeah. for uses and not yeah. users. And so I just want to be careful around that conversation of user um, right. and, and focus it on the uses that and the, and the suite of uses that are before you today. So let's edge back the other way. Do we see that happening in other areas where we zone RA7? Councillor, uh, throughout the cities, there's instances of uh, RA7 zonings, uh, whether that's in new neighbourhoods, established neighbourhoods, uh, the centre of the city, all over, large swaths of all over are zoned RA7. Uh, there's nothing that points to RA7 as being a zone uh, that uh, can attribute to, I guess, negative effects on a neighbourhood. Okay. Um has it been? Hmm. No, I can't ask that question. All right, so the next question then obviously would be when it comes to um, zoning for RA7, you know, the idea that it would be better to wait. Uh, do not zone this way because if we wait and after COVID and after the economy recovers, then uh, and after all, you know, majority of office space that uh, people want to be in is filled, then someone can come in and build some office space and commercial space at Station Point, and it will become a destination place for people who want to take the LRT um, out of their neighborhood into this neighborhood to visit a doctor or something like that. Um, you know, how does that differ from what was already there besides the besides the residential in the, in the DC one? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the last part of the question, there, Councillor. Um, just so in the DC one, as it is, uh, you know, it's intended for commercial and business, and in order to uh, you know maybe entice builders, there was also the idea that you could also build a tall tower. Um, so I'm just wondering what the fundamental difference would be in maybe just zoning it just to commercial. And if we, like what the implications would be for, for that. So part of the, uh, the supporting doc documentation for the uh, this rezoning was that market study by Atlas Altus Group. Uh, and within it, it found that there was very little market for any sort of office in the area. Uh, and, and further, the area is oversaturated with retail uh, for its catchment area. So rezoning it to an office um, is, is probably not the best use, considering the surrounding adjacent uses as well in the Kennedale industrial area, which you have uh, a transitioning industrial area into uh, industrial businesses. Uh, so there, there are different employment nodes around in the area, and I think that points towards why this area wouldn't be a suitable area for additional office space. Okay, and we should probably address the question of uh, the feeling uh, or the statement that we got that um, administration was not engaged with the with the BIA when they did community engagement. Um, would you respond to that? So administration has worked with the BIA, the executive director, uh, throughout the last two years. Uh, there has been continual meetings uh, with that group as well as an offer to present to the board which was declined. Uh, the BIA was involved in all of the public engagement activities that were held uh, over the last few years on it. Uh, so I'm not sure where that comment uh, stems from. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Katarina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, Mr. Pollock, uh, I think you've been around long enough to have some historical or um, understanding of, of uh, where we are today uh, with uh, Station Point and with uh, Fort Road in general. Um, the uh, uh, widening of uh, Fort Road from Yellowhead uh, to 66th Street was the last portion of the uh, truck route. Uh, that uh, uh, is going to be done or starting the planning work is uh, being done right now. Is that correct? Yes, that's part of the overall uh, Yellowhead expansion as well. Right. Uh, and, and this piece uh, came to us and that was contemplated uh, over a decade ago when the city acquired uh, the lands north of Fort Road uh, 
where the old uh, the used car dealerships were and uh, allowed them to release it back until such time they were ready uh, for that expansion and uh, agreements now are in place with uh, CN for the uh, for the bridge and so forth. Kathleen Andrews uh, was built uh, uh, on need, uh, but certainly that location was uh, an appropriate location uh, because it had sat vacant for so many years and the fact that it has a good uh, transportation around it, the access uh, to it. So that was all part and parcel of Fort Road uh, and the CRL. So Kathleen Andrews brought in employment. Uh, we're expanding the uh, truck route, which will benefit all the commercial uh, area, the BIA, absolutely, uh, uh, in order to have that corridor opened. Uh, the 12 uh, uh, acres that are left uh, next to Kathleen Andrews are for sale now after being serviced uh, privately. Uh, I'll say that. So every, it, it isn't Station Point by itself. Uh, there's been a plan for the last decade or more uh, on the general area on how to get all these things in place in order to make station lands uh, viable. And those are starting to happen now. Mr. Pollock? Uh, correct, yeah, there's multiple moving parts uh, within the area as you've outlined. Um, and Station Point uh, works within that. Um, but as noted, we haven't seen that uptake uh, in this area to date. Uh, and what that analysis has borne out is because of the overly restrictive uh, zoning and requirements and the ambitiousness of uh, those zones uh, that are needed to develop in there. Right. The DC-1, I mean, we're, we're saying DC-1 as, a, as sort of a DC and being a little bit prescriptive, but the DC-1 placed on Station Point was so restrictive uh, in its conditions that we've had two failures uh, to this point. I, w I would agree that the, the zoning has contributed uh, to that. Yep. It's yeah, from the first uh, mm -hmm. to it. The, uh, it's been made a point that the location of it, because it's next to uh, the rail, uh, has, you know, made a point that uh, maybe not suitable for uh, inhabitants. But uh, that was addressed uh, through the CRL with a $10 million barrier wall landscaped uh, to that uh, to that rail, isn't that correct? To the south of uh, Station Point. Correct. There is a noise attenuation wall uh, that was built by the city to address the noise concerns. Right, and uh, safety concerns, and uh, the aesthetic concerns uh, uh, that were um, uh, were there at the time. So uh, that that was addressed. And at this point in time, uh, certainly uh, we can compare this to, I mean, TOD, you think high rise, but we go to station, uh, station lands uh, with Rohit now uh, developing uh, there where the majority of it is going to be medium rise to five, six stories uh, versus the four towers that were contemplated before. So there is a change in thinking of what TODs, how TODs can work. Correct. I think there's multiple ways of achieving the goals uh, that are set out within the transit oriented development uh, guidelines and that general overall, overall thinking. Uh, low rise, uh, medium rise, or medium density uh, is a good way to meet those objectives. And the other uh, sort of, uh, uh, not that it's missing, uh, the other point here is that uh, with the Yellowhead uh, redevelopment, uh, 66th Street now will be a flyover uh, that will change uh, some of the dynamics around the general area uh, in cleanup uh, uh, per se with the uh, uh, some of the unsightly properties that uh, are on 66th Street before you get to uh, Kathleen Andrews uh, area uh, as well too. And that's going to be happening as well. So that's another moving part uh, of the general area in order to support Fort Road and its redevelopment. Correct, there's lots of improvements uh, going around in the area. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Uh, Thank I you. I don't see any other questions of administration, so we're uh, just about out of time, but we would be into new information now. So um, 
Councillor Henderson is willing to move another extension for. I'm, it feels to me like we're getting close here. So I would move another, uh, I'll say half an hour. I don't think it'll take half an hour, but I'll move another half hour. Okay. Second. Seconded by Councillor Walters. Uh, is there any debate on that? Not seeing any, then please vote on extending for another half hour. Yes. Up to, if needed. Bring it to me. Uh, it's not popping up on my screen. This is Andrew Mack. I'll say yes. We just need a moment to get it set up, please. I'll, uh, uh, okay, it's coming. Just take, uh, okay. There it is. Okay. We need votes for Councillor Zadig and Councillor Nickel, if they're still Councillor Nickel line. voted verbally. Oh, sorry. Oh, and Councillor Knack. Yes, it's still not showing up, so I'm a yes. Thank you. We're good to go. Okay, display the vote. And that's carried 11 to 2. Uh, so will is beginning to shift. <laughs> Uh, un that is noted. All right, uh, let me see if there is any new information which arose during the public hearing. Um, uh, Ms. Auger, is there any new information? No. Nope. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Janvier, is there any new information from you? No new information, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Belrose? No one new information, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. St. Aubin? No new information here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Grimble, do you have any new information arising from the discussion so far? Um, i just like to bring one point forward, which is also in the Altus report, related to a discussion about the implication of the size of the units and under the RA7. And basically what they said here is that uh, in their report is that a key success factor would be to plan projects feasibility by recognizing the location is likely to support uh, lower than average prices and rents um, for this product. So I'd leave your imagination to that. Thank you. Um... Mr. Leong? I know new information. Okay. Um, thank you. I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing then. I'll close it if uh, Councillor Paquette uh, is not. Uh, Councillor Paquette? Oh, feel free. If you're a lot better at this than I am. Okay. I'll close public hearing. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Okay. Uh, to close public hearing, please vote. Yes. Display the vote, please. Uh, we're still looking for oh. Councillor Knack's vote. Oh. Sorry, I'll have to say yes again. Still not popping up. Yes. Oh, there we go. go. Display the vote. That's carried unanimously. Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, the amendment first on uh, 314. Seconder. Second. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. Okay, uh, on the amendment in 314, uh, 14. which amends the Fort Road or Old Town Master Plan. Uh, is there anyone wishing to speak to that, or? Uh, just really quickly, uh, this has been um, not an easy path for anyone. A, there were um, expectations from the community on what Fort Road was going to look like for a very long time, for many, many years, that never came to fruition. The one attempt we had uh, from BCN, we saw how that how that played out. It was uh, before um, in 
we found ourselves in, in uh, basically a situation where we're going to be all working to improve the economy over the next few years. Um, Fort Road has quite a bit of commercial, and the commercial that is there in the BIA, what I've heard, is that they just want more customers. And um, what I've heard from the community is that they want more families. So I am taking those things into account, um, sort of weighed the scales for me a little bit toward the rezoning. Um, I totally understand the, uh, the opinion and the feeling that, um, that maybe if we, if we just waited um, a few more years, we did a little bit more searching, that we would find the right uh, developers to, to turn this into a commercial uh, landing zone. But after a year after year after year, after that long, eventually you, you've got to start seeing the writing in the sky. And at this point, it seems that uh, if we can um, develop this land in a way that is a community benefit, that will bring families, that will bring customers, um, that will uh, sort of fulfill uh, the requirements of, of having a little bit of a transit-adjacent development actually fulfilled, then, you know, this rezoning, that this may just be the, the tool for that. Um, it also closes the book on over a decade of angst for the whole community, um, just having, you know, all of these possibilities hang over their head that were never fulfilled, and now we actually have some closure and some answers. Um, again, if there was going to be a big commercial developer interested in this area, they would have come already. They would have looked at the land. They would have suggested a rezoning for the purposes, and that just hasn't happened. Or again, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but experience may suggest that maybe that's not where we should be placing our bets at this point. So, um, although it is close for me, I am going to be uh, supporting uh, this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else before I go to Councillor Katarina to close? Councillor Katarina? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, uh, I think uh, this particular project has been uh, extremely challenging, uh, uh, no question about that. But there have been many, many successes along Fort Road and the BIA and uh, Baldwin Belvedere communities uh, directly adjacent uh, to it over the last uh, many years. And uh, to think of this project as uh, the entire uh, Fort Road uh, redevelopment uh, is incorrect uh, because there have been so many moving parts that have been planned uh, sequential uh, that some came to fruition early, some as late as the Yellowhead renewal, which gave us the opportunity to finally finish that truck route and uh, the challenges of getting underneath that bridge on a monthly basis with the truck stuck or not, uh, the challenges uh, negotiating with CN uh, for years and years on whether we could use their right of way to expand that bridge and double it in order to accommodate the roads. Uh, land was expropriated by the city uh, many, many years ago in anticipation of that happening. Uh, moving the cat uh, moving the uh, Westwood uh, garage to that site uh, for a rebuild uh, was all part and parcel of a plan for Fort Road. Uh, the 12 uh, acres of service lots now that are available was always planned for, for that as well too. And then Yellowhead Trail, uh, to uh, redo Yellowhead Trail uh, has been planned since I've been there uh, the past 13 years. Uh, that that needed uh, to be addressed. It took that long uh, in order to put the finances in place. So I don't want anybody to think uh, that Fort Road has been neglected all these years. It has had uh, many, many uh, investments from the city and from the community and everything was tied together. This is the last remnant that we uh, worked for at least the last four years uh, in trying to uh, uh, understand what that DC one meant, how difficult it was, uh, the uptake wasn't there. And I think that at this point in time now, administration has absolutely come forward with the right approach uh, to this, 
TODs do not have to be high rises. Stadium uh, lands uh, certainly tell us that, that TODs and successful TODs uh, don't have to be high rises. They can be uh, uh, RA7s and RA8s uh, uh, just as well, and that uh, contributes to the density of, uh, of the city. Uh, so I, I want to leave uh, the association as well, too, that uh, uh, support is always there for you. Uh, but I think we have to uh, get a good understanding of what drives businesses. And uh, again, I'll say that if I was in that BIA and haven't been involved in business all my life, the one thing that I would want is customers. I wouldn't want the offices closed at 430 in the afternoon and no one else around. Uh, until the next morning. And, and that, to me, is something that uh, I think we, we're, we're almost there now. Uh, we've brought employment, uh, we've brought funds, uh, we've brought infrastructure uh, to the area. This now is the last remnant uh, of city-owned lands that we can control and develop. There are other lands, uh, certainly the tire shop next to Belvedere Station has always been in the eye of either us, the city, or others, uh, that that's a great uh, place for redevelopment. And north side of uh, Fort Road, uh, I think uh, with residences uh, going, in, going here, uh, they will thrive and redevelop uh, either themselves or others will see the area as very, very promising. And the last note is, uh, uh, we have uh, some good news. Uh, the Transit Hotel is being uh, renovated uh, to reopen privately. Uh, and certainly from a historic point of view, that's great. Uh, from a commercial point of view, that's great. Uh, so things are happening on Fort Road. And I don't want anybody to be left with the idea that uh, nothing's happened uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, uh, many things have happened, and this is just the last piece of... Uh, of the redevelopment uh, that we need uh, at this point in time. So uh, I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, please vote on the recommendation in item 314. 314, yeah. Please vote. Yeah. Councillor Katarina, can we get your vote, please? Oh, I, oh, I didn't submit. Sorry. Yeah. We're good to go. Thank you. Display the vote. That's carried unanimously. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, uh, first reading of uh, 315 and 16. Councillor Paquette to second. Sorry, Mike was on. Yep, thanks. Okay. Uh, please vote on first reading of the two bylaws. Yes. Display the vote. That's carried 12 to 1. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll move second reading of uh, 315 16. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote on second reading. Yes. We're good to go. Display the vote. That's carried 12 to 1. I'll move uh, consideration uh, for third reading on 15 and 16, 315, 16. To, uh, so, uh, thank you. Moved and seconded to allow third reading to proceed. Please vote. Yes. We're good to go. Display the vote. That's carried. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, third reading of uh, 19251 and 19262. Second. Third and final reading, please vote. Yes. We're good to go. Thank you. Display the vote. 
and that's carried 12 to 1. Now, uh, before you get too excited, we do have uh, Councillor Carmel's subsequent motion arising from the Windermere matter earlier. So, uh, Councillor Carmel, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my motion is as follows, that administration provide a report to council describing potential solutions and budget impacts to traffic concerns, including one, congestion and travel times on Windermere Boulevard from Twilliger Drive to Windermere Drive, and two, traffic safety concerns on Windermere Road from Windermere Boulevard North, particularly near St. John the 23rd and Constable Woodall Schools. Awesome. The due date of... Okay, seconded by Councillor Henderson. Uh, Continue introducing it. Anything further, Councillor? Uh, I have nothing further to add. I think everyone's uh, cognizant of what we're talking about earlier. So, it's out of that. Clerks have the wording. Okay. Are there any questions on the motion? Councillor Walters? Oh, just if we can get it in the chat, just to look at it quick. Sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, just one adjustment. It should uh, be through committee um, as we bring those back online. Fair enough. Thought you might say that. Okay. Um, other than that, I think uh, this is good follow up. So, um, any further questions on this one? Anyone wishing to speak? I do, Mr. Mayor. The e-scribe's not allowing me to log on. Okay, go ahead, Councilor Zadek. I, I know there's not going to be a lengthy debate on this, but I don't think I'm going to support this for similar reasons to why I haven't supported other site-specific um, inquiries like this before. I'll call it an inquiry, but just I, I think administration's aware of the issue, and, and they probably don't need political support to uh, get on this. And um, if, it, if we see it at a, in a future budget that's a different thing but just right now I, I'm hesitant to, with all these uh, subsequent motions um, that I'm trying to see a pattern for on for roadways and I'm, I'm just I think I'm going to vote against this and if anyone else uh, speaks to it maybe they'll convince me otherwise I just wanted to flag that okay thank you any others wishing to speak to it uh, Councillor Cartmel to close very quickly, I'll just reinforce that we did hear from the neighborhood and, and I do have a lot of correspondence that uh, the traffic situation and the transportation system in this neighborhood is very, very badly challenged. Uh, and with the particular concern in front of the school uh, uh, and with respect to Councillor Zadek's comments, I have tried the administration route. Uh, it's true, they do have their hands full, but I believe this is worthy of sending a signal that this is a priority for council. Uh, and particularly with that new development uh, now uh, potentially coming on, uh, a bad situation is going to be further exacerbated. So uh, really seek your support on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please vote. Yes. We're good to go. And display the vote. And that's carried 12 to 1. Are there any notices of motion? Okay. Just that I'm at it. <laughs> well, as we all are. So uh, uh, thank you all uh, for staying a little bit later. Um, I think incremental increase rather than uh, powering bulldozing through the dinner break is better. So thank you for that suggestion, Councillor Henderson. Let's adjourn for the night and we'll continue yesterday's council meeting tomorrow morning. See you, some of you there. Good night. <laughs>